Good morning and welcome to the Land Use and Livability Subcommittee meeting, January 15th, 2020. And the first order of business is call to order. And we also have a call to public, and we do have one card. Joel Copeland? Copeland? Come on up. <laughs> you get to go first. Yes. Uh, council members, Vice Mayor, thank you so much for allowing us to speak like this. Uh, my name is Joel Copeland. I'm a, a, an artist and a painter. In fact, I painted the mural. It's in the, entr the exit way now. It used to be the entryway, but now it's the exit. Um, my wife and I own a building where we house our gallery on uh, um, South 11th Avenue between Jefferson and Madison. And I'm here today just to speak to you about the uh, uh, crisis that's becoming of the, pop the um, homeless population. And any given day or night, there's a couple of hundred people sleeping on the street. And you can imagine um, how difficult it is to sell paintings in our gallery, Gallery 119, when there are all these people on the street. And all the other businesses around us are suffering as well. Um, I would like to propose a solution, a temporary solution anyway, because it's a, it's a, not only is it a, a, a humanitarian thing, but it's a sanitary thing. There are no bathrooms around there, so the back of our building becomes the bathroom and all over the, everywhere else. And I just would like to say, just as an idea, I don't know what happened to uh, Joe Arpaio's tents, you know, but I think, you know, they're, I think they're county owned, but if we were to be able to uh, borrow those tents from the county and put them up behind the CAS unit or to put them up behind St. Vincent de Paul to get the, a place where these people could get off the streets and get into a place that's safe, get into a place that's covered, and get into a place where they could have porta potties or somewhere to go to the bathroom, uh, I think it would be a, um, a great thing and a great help to the community, to the business community and to the, to the people that exist this way, um, if we could provide a, a temporary solution. I know that there are some long-term solutions that we need to discuss and uh, uh, ways to help the homeless population and, uh, to end the business population as well. Thank you. We can't respond to call to the public, um, but we do have some staff here and maybe they can connect with you on your idea. Um, I'm going to go out of order for one more item. Uh, Representative Aaron Lieberman is here, but he has to go do important business down at the state. So he's here on items that are later in the agenda, but I wanted him to come up because we want to thank him. He helped provide a great solution to us, and I think he, we owe him a debt of gratitude. Thank you, Representative. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the council and the mayor and all of the residents around 22nd Street. We didn't get everything that we wanted, but boy, did we get a solution that is so much better for the preserve and will be so much less disruptive for so many of the neighbors. And I just want to say from the first meeting, and for those of you who were there, many of the people in these seats were there, um, the city said, look, we're 30% planned and we're here to take public input. And that's exactly what they did. I also just want to say thank you so much to the Arizona Department of Transportation who sat down really as partners in this and were so willing to work together. Sometimes we can all work together to do uh, great things and I'm just so happy with the result. And I really wanna say thank you to everybody who's involved, the water department, everybody who really worked together to make this happen. Um, as some of you know, I grew up right on 22nd Street, just a, just a probably 20 houses down from the 22nd Street trailhead. Anyone who's ever been in those mountains know how beautiful that preserve is. And the fact that we'll be able to keep the preserve preserved, I think is just a wonderful thing. So, and thank you for letting me sneak in here first. We've got to be on the floor at 11, but thanks again. Absolutely. Yeah, tell, why don't you tell everyone what you did? Take, um, cr take credit. I know, I know the mayor helped a lot, too. I'm well, gonna, I, I, one, one I'm result gonna... of riding, a, riding a, a dirt bike and hiking through those mountains for the first 18 years of my life was that I knew those mountains pretty well. And um, just, I, I actually remember quite clearly mountain biking when, the, when they were building the 51, and all of us in the neighborhood at the time could not believe that there were these big, huge bulldozers and tractors in the preserve. And um, the, the, those streets used to always go through. You used to be able to get over to, it was called George's Ole, I used to be able to, now it's our enchiladas, used to be able to get over there. And it, just a recognition that there's a lot of dead space right alongside the 51. And the real idea was, and even the, the principal at Madison Heights, they're not thrilled about uh, having the pipe go through the back 
of the, the play yard there, but they understand it. But the core idea was to just go over closer to the 51, where there's really, even on 20th Street, there aren't houses that front that. It's, it's, it's much smaller of an area. It gets very narrow into this uh, Arizona Department of Transportation right of way, and that's what they've been really, really willing to work with the city on. So I think it's just been a, a great result all, all around, and the hikers can, can hike, and not a lot of people hike alongside the, the freeway anyways right now. So there will be a little bit of disruption over there, but much less than it otherwise would have been. Well, again, thank you for your help. I know the mayor also put in a lot of calls to ADOT as well. Uh, I appreciate everything you did to help us. Thanks again. So have fun at the legislature. Yeah, we, we always <laughs> do. Thank, thanks again, okay. everybody. Thank you. So why don't we move then to our agenda. Oh, first is the minutes of the meeting. Move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And the ayes have it. We also have a consent agenda, items two through six. I move approval. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the ayes have it. We also have a couple information items, uh, seven and eight. Any clarification on those? Are we good to get into our agenda? Yeah, we're good. Okay, great. So we are first going to go to our gated alley pilot program update. And there will probably be some possible actions with That's it. That's right. Okay. Welcome. And, and just for the audience, because we have speakers on each one of these items, I'm just going to stay with the agenda number. So I hope you guys will be interested in our other items. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, we're here to uh, provide an update on the Gated Alley pilot program. Uh, this subcommittee provided direction back in October 2019 on research that we will present here uh, and ask for guidance on how we proceed forward. I do have with me uh, Ms. Sandy Hoffman, who's the Assistant Director in the Planning Development Department, and Mr. Jesse Duarte, who's a Deputy Director in the Public Works Department, who have both been instrumental in working on this uh, pilot program and the things we're going to present uh, here uh, this morning. By way of background, this particular um, issue uh, rose uh, up to the council discussion back in 2017 because there were concerns from community uh, and neighborhood groups about alley uh, issues with illegal dumping, graffiti, unwarranted uh, you know, activity and trespass access into neighborhood areas uh, via use of alleys. And so there was a pilot program that was developed back then uh, centered around the Royal Palm neighborhood and Sunny Slope area. Uh, and then back in December 2018, uh, there was a, the first gate was installed within uh, Royal Palm, uh, and we'll see some pictures of that here in just a minute. To date, there have been nine uh, total gates in Royal Palm, plus one underway, and there are two applications and petitions in Sunny Slope to, uh, to go forward and gate some of those alleys. Um, we did get a request uh, from this subcommittee, as I uh, noted ba uh, back in October, to expand the Gated Alley pilot program to other parts of the city. By way of uh, that continued background, you see the, the gate here to the left, which is the Royal Palm neighborhood. That was the one that was installed uh, you know, back uh, in December of uh, 2018. The Royal Palm area is uh, Dunlap Northern 7th and 19th Avenue. Uh, and the Sunny Slope pilot area is Dunlap, Butler, Central over to uh, 12th Street. And so uh, really what worked in this uh, shorter pilot program was there was a lot of community interest uh, in uh, gating the alleys and moving trash uh, pickup out of the alleys to curbside areas, controlling access to alleys. Um, one of the things that we have to try and balance is as part of the pilot program, having the gated alleys uh, and the closed off ones in proximity to each other or in a service area that works for the public works department because they have to actually you know, go pick up the refuse and it's different types of trucks that are used to make that happen. And really nine to 10 alleys kind of per pilot area seems to be the number that works really well um, you know, as we have, we have went forward on this so far. Um, so the subcommittee requested follow up back in October to uh, look at how to develop a funding process, how to streamline the existing processes there, and how to expand it to all the council districts. And so I will turn it over to um, uh, Sandy, who was going to talk about the alley abandonment, because that was also something that uh, Councilman Garcia asked us to, to look at back in October. And uh, then I'll be back to uh, kind of summarize at the end here. Good morning. 
Alley abandonments was considered as an option and we looked into it. There is a fee of $1,075 for an application to abandon an alley. There's a notification process and a public hearing process as well. Once an alley has been approved to be abandoned by the council district, uh, council in a council district, there needs to be a fee paid for that owner to purchase that property. So the consideration fee be one dollar per square foot, up to five hundred square feet, and then ten cents per square foot thereafter. Residents will incur additional costs by moving fences or rebuilding fences. Utilities are located in the majority of the alleys within the city. Therefore, they have to have 24-hour access. So anytime an alley has a utility that a public um, infrastructure that has to be worked on, then they will come in and they will remove any gates or they will remove any fences that are in their way. And the owners would have to replace those once that work is done. It's a more t costly and time-intensive um, way to gate the alleys than just doing the gated alley pilot program. We were asked to also look into different locking mechanisms. The top right corner is the one that we're currently using. It's a key system. It costs about two to three dollars per lock. It can access, control the access to the alleys. Disadvantages is that residents could lose the keys and staff have to administer and manage distributing the keys. The bottom left corner is electronic smart lock. The advantage is it's keyless, convenient, and speedy. Disadvantage, the cost is between $90 and $200 per lock. They may not operate if the power failure happens, and neighbors may not have that technology to be able to use them. The push button lock has an advantage of no key and convenient, has a four-digit code, but it costs between $40 to $140 per lock. And again, neighbors could maybe forget the code, or the code could get out to a variety of different people in the neighborhood that you don't want them to have the code and they could have access. The bottom right corner one is a similar one. It's a rolling lock combination. And again, similar to what the push button one had, the same advantages and disadvantages. The cost for that may be between $50 and $100 per lock. Yes. Sure, madam. So um, with, the, with the system that we have now with the master key, the one, how many, do we know how that's going in terms of are people losing the key, how we've gotten many phone calls about people losing the key. How is that working so far? Right. Madam Chair, um, Vice Mayor, and subcommittee members, it's been working very well. We haven't had that many neighbors coming back to saying they lost the key. And again, it's they only have the four alley segments in Royal Palm right now. And we haven't had any issues with the keys at this time. Just follow up, because um, maybe we should just maybe um, you know, talk to them. I don't know how we communicate with them to see if they are happy with that with that system. Um, trying to figure out if they're happy with it, then maybe it's some. And, and I understand why we're looking at all these different options. I, I understand that, but maybe we should just check in with them to see how are they liking it. If if they are happy with it, or would they rather have one of these other options as well? Certainly. And maybe, I, I actually have talked to uh, a couple of the residents and um, actually the guy that spearheaded this entire program, and he said they're quite pleased. So they haven't had problems, but again, it's been there, what, about a year now? Yeah, so, about a year. But so far, so good. Yes. <laughs> so proposed enhancements to the gated program would include creating a guide to assist neighbors um, through the process, eliminating the bond funds, or having one blanket bond fund. Anytime there's work happening in a right-of-way, and this is alley right-of-way, typically we have bonds posted to make sure the work gets done and then the bonds are returned. So we are um, considering as part of the improvements is to eliminate that bond, especially since our third option would be to include a qualified vendor list of qualified licensed fence gate companies to do the work and obviously their experience with doing work in the right of way and the quality of work that they would provide and that would help support not having to have a bond posted. The other item would be to create a standard detail for the fence. Again, that would simplify things, make it easier and consistent uh, throughout a different neighborhood. The uh, Part of improving the locking system is already described, and there's a different variety of things. We will look back at what's happened in Royal Palm to confirm how they feel about it. Improving the efficiency of the inspections, again, by doing gated uh, inspections and batches and having a qualified vendor list that is familiar with our program should make it easier for inspectors, reducing man hours and cost. And we're in the researching the funding sources. We'll be talking a little bit later about potential sources for funding to help support paying for the gates. With that, Jesse. Do you have a list of 
people waiting to get these gates? So, Madam Chair, <laughs> subcommittee members, we have Planning and Development Department has been um, collecting calls and inquiries <laughs> regarding gating alleys, and we have that data where we've been tracking it as to what different neighborhoods and the individuals and their locations. So we do have people that have connected with the staff and Planning and Development Department, and we've been keeping that data. The reason I'm wondering if, if they're interested in a block grant to the police department through that, I think now is the time to put the application in. So if we're going to proceed with this, um, I think it would be very important that's communicated to them so they can get a grant submitted to be considered. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and Councilwoman uh, Williams, the uh, the grant process, as I understand it, we've closed uh, in December uh, for this this last year, um, and so what we are proposing, uh, and we'll talk about here in a little bit, is going to the Public Safety and Justice Subcommittee in February uh, with an agenda item to uh, have the subcommittee provide direction to the Neighborhood Block Watch uh, Grant uh, uh, Oversight Committee on uh, doing a special. Um, uh, uh, application process just for gated alleys uh, so that we don't have to wait until uh, next year uh, to apply because the the application window is November to December and so um, when we were evaluating this and, and then looking at it that was it was right in the window of well it starts uh, you know next week and it's a it's a short window because there's a lot of applications and a lot to review so We've had some tentative discussions with the police department uh, and uh, the chair of the, the block watch group to talk about this in concept, but that's what will be on the February uh, public safety subcommittee agenda to get that direction to talk about the specifics on that. Uh, the, the item before this subcommittee today would, is really about establishing the parameters of the program um, that would be uh, you know, uh, citywide and, and how we would administer that. Separately would be that discussion from uh, public safety about how some of that funding gets in. So there may be gates that would be installed as part of the pilot program, like Royal Palm, that might not go through the, the, the Block Watch grant funding process, but they would still be in the pilot and they would choose to pay for the gates themselves uh, to do it like uh, Royal Palm did. As part of that information you're going to be distributing, are you giving the average cost of what this did? Uh, yeah, Madam Chair uh, and uh, Councilwoman Williams, uh, I think Sandy can provide uh, some of that information. We are talking about it. Part of what we're we're proposing uh, on that qualified vendor list would be to uh, to go out and have companies get on that list that could also then uh, hopefully provide some economies of scale in terms of being able to procure gates, know that you know they're one of the the vendors who would be doing that work and get better pricing on it than what we got as part of uh, the the Royal Palm ones that were installed. So each neighborhood that wants a gate, would they work with the contractor or do they have to come back through you? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Williams, as, as envisioned today, it would be uh, you know, the qualified vendor list. If the subcommittee votes to direct staff to go forward with that today, we would um, go forward and, and develop that, and then we would uh, give that list of whoever those those vendors are to a neighborhood group uh, who was selected, uh, you know, to be part of the pilot program, uh, met some criteria that would be established, like you know, reports the instances of dumping, police activity in alleys, some criteria as to, to how we're using that money, because it still is public money, and so we still have to account for where that money goes, and that's why the, the qualified vendor list would say, here's three or four contractors who can do this work. You can choose from those ones. They understand the city process. They know the, the detail, what to do. We have comfort level that we don't need to get a bond from them, because they will do that, and then we would work to, to pay those uh, individual vendors who are selected, that way the city can keep track of where that money is going because that's part of our, our fiduciary responsibilities. Let me see if I got this. The neighborhood says I want it. You have already have a list. They contact you. They want to go ahead. You talk to the contractor. The neighborhood, if they go through the block watch, do they, the neighborhood get the check and then give it to you? Is that how it's done? 
Uh, well, the that the specifics of all of that will be part of the public safety and justice subcommittee because that's the the subcommittee that has the the oversight of the neighborhood block watch. Yeah, I'm uh, on that process. one too. So. Right, <laughs> right, and so we are coming back in in February to outline that whole uh, process. But oh, as okay. as envisioned right now, because um, one of the challenges that we identified with. Uh, particularly the Sunny Slope, uh, you know, pilot area that went underway is that paying for the gates uh, in area in some parts of the city is going to be difficult. Um, right. You layer that on to the fact that you have people who, uh, you know, want to improve their neighborhood, but there's lots of illegal dumping and other unwanted activity happening in those alleys. But they're working two jobs, raising kids. How do they go hire a vendor to make sure that that work is done? Then keep track of the paperwork because the the city has to require that because it's public money is being used. So that's where the qualified vendor list, you know, came in so that we have someone who is on there uh, and they can give us a good price and then we can make sure that we alleviate some of that stress of those neighborhood groups who are trying to, to do that. I'm just for the gate, so I just wonder. Mm -hmm. yeah. Madam Chair, uh, Vice Mayor and subcommittee members, as a follow up per council, I will go over a couple of slides regarding alleys. The first slide, if you look at it, it's the total number of alleys that are the city of Phoenix. And it's broken down per council district as well. If you look at the total number citywide, it's about 48, about 4,846 uh, alleys with about 876 miles. If you look at the uh, district four has the total higher number of alleys is 1,262 with about 204 miles. Uh, if we look at district five, you have 658 alleys with a 142 in, in miles, and the District 8 at 894 with 137, and then District 1 up there with 310 with 77 miles. These are, again, these are the total number of alleys that are in the city of Phoenix right now currently and the miles driven. So based on the previous slide that you saw, the city of Phoenix Saw Waste Department currently collects in 77% of those alleys and we provide service in those alleys. On the other 23%, we do not. And based on the 23%, the reason that we're not in those alleys in the past is because we've had residents want to convert, want to go from alley to curb. We've had issues where uh, emergency situations where we've had to relocate it because we've had floods in the alleys when the rainstorms come through and we can't get back in there. Uh, and also too in the past, we, in the past couple of years back or 10, about 10, 15 years back, some of those alleys that were established were not for collection anyway. So that's where the 23% comes from. Uh, before I hand, the, hand the, uh, the remote back over to uh, planning development, what I want you to see is a picture of this truck. When you look at this picture of the truck, this is what our drivers go through on a daily basis going through alleys. Look how tight he's <laughs> hugging to the fence side. Look at the wires that they're trying to maneuver, and then you see some illegal, either illegal dumping or it's bulk collection coming around. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's one of the nice alleys, yes. Thank you. So some of the expansion considerations would include illegal dumping data that Public Works has been keeping, graffiti actions that Neighborhood Services Department has been responding to, calls for service, the police crime statistics, and as mentioned earlier, there's a resident interest list that Planning and Development's been keeping. Other considerations would be the neighborhood area for effectiveness and efficiency. As mentioned earlier, we had graphics of Royal Palm and Sunny Slope. Having it within a certain geographic area allows for tracking the data to verify the success of a program. A manageable number of alleys could be used, perhaps that replicates what Royal Palm and Sunny Slope pilot areas had. Having the existence of a neighborhood association or a block watch group would help provide some investment, investing in the neighborhood and being engaged and being accountable so that they are part of the whole process to ensure that it's a success. And funding. So the cost for one right iron gate right now that Royal Palm had installed, similar to the image up there, was $4,500. And so there's limited discretionary income by some neighbors, and so therefore there may be a need for funding to help support them to put the, the gates in. The zoning ordinance currently does not allow chain link with our current zoning ordinance. And so, and chain link, um, again, would something that we would think that the wrought iron would be more of a durable visual quality that you would want to add to a neighborhood that you could be proud of as you see that when you come into your neighborhood. With that, I'll pass on to Alan. Uh, thank you. 
next proposed uh, steps. Uh, staff is asking for a subcommittee authorization uh, to go forward with a public safety and justice subcommittee to discuss uh, the how we would develop a uh, pilot program through uh, our neighborhood block grant watch process to have a special uh, gated alley pilot program funding you know effort um, and then proceed with developing a vendor list to secure two to three contractors who can do uh, this work and would be ones uh, that would meet the city qualifications and standards and hopefully be able to to give us some economies of scale in terms of, of better pricing uh, and uh, you know a gate where these were these were custom fabricated gates that Royal Palm paid for um, and they're they're very nice but I don't know that that's uh, you know what we I need to have throughout the whole city, but then there's the other side, which Sandy mentioned of the chain link fences that isn't permitted. So somewhere in there, we'd be looking as part of that qualified vendor list of how could we get to a uh, rod iron ice quality, but still get a good price that would be installed so that whatever money gets allocated as part of the, the neighborhood block uh, watch grant process could fund more gate you know, options. Uh, and then establish guidelines to assist the neighborhood residents through the the process steps to have your handout and online information so that there would be a, a pilot program that would cover all of the, the uh, council districts and that pilot program would allow for a neighborhood group to apply and do their own gated process if they wanted to do like Royal Palm or also go apply for the grant process to to pay for the gates utilizing the, the process that we will hopefully get authorization from Public Safety Subcommittee to talk about uh, in February. And uh, with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and I appreciate your uh, recommendations. I will say that I actually helped create this pilot program because of something that happened in the Royal Palm neighborhood, and I have had a chance to talk to several of the residents that do have the Gates and they said it's been a tremendous uh, change. They're thrilled. As a matter of fact, I think they're talking about doing a community garden if the utilities will buy off on it. So I think it's been a success and I, I would like to see it broadened. So, any comments? Any I'll motions? Go, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go. I'll, so I'll make them um, <clears throat> before I make the motion. First, I just want to thank Ellen. I want to. I want to thank. I want. I just want to thank everyone for all the work that we've done. I know Jesse, you were out there with me, right? We drove through the streets of Maryvale. We went through the alleys, right? And I, and and, and it's a huge issue throughout throughout the whole city. Um, but when I was campaigning and I was running for office, was one of the biggest issues that I heard in, in District 5 was how, what, it, what was it that we could do to deal with the illegal dumping, and people just wanted to make sure that they were able to get their alleys back. I think um, having a clean alley also reflects on how people feel when they're coming home from work. I think like we need to, we need to make sure that people feel proud, people feel good as they're coming back home from work. Um, people work long hours, and I think this is this program will definitely give people back the the peace that they need and being able to go back there and see that their alleys are clean. Um, that was also like a huge frustration where we had a lot of residents that would go out there and, and clean and clean the alleys mm -hmm. and do the work. And then they would go out in, in the evening and put out their trash and the alley looked the same way as it looked the day before. Um, and, and that's been a huge frustration and it has led into people like not caring much for their alleys anymore. Um, so I think that with the gated, um, with the gated alleys, that, that will definitely change. Um, and I am very thankful to everyone for the commitment. Um, Councilwoman Stark, thank you so much for starting starting this a few years ago. And now hopefully we'll be able to move forward with this great program. So with that, um, I would like to make a motion to approve expanding the gated alley program pilot to all the council districts to include up to 10 alley segments per council district Staff will attend the Public Safety and Justice Subcommittee on February 12th to discuss using Black Watch grant funds to pay for gated with, with the party being areas with the most needs, including consideration of dumping, graffiti, and crime statistics and socioeconomic challenges. In addition, staff will initiate a procurement process to create a vendor list for several licensed fence gate contractors to simplify 
the process for neighborhoods and guidelines will be established to assist residents through the gated alley program pilot process. Second? Second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Just for the record, I would add that as individual alleys uh, come forward, we will talk to those property owners about the abandonment process if it's something that might work. It is a, a good suggestion from the standpoint if there isn't utilities, then they might be better off going that route. Uh, the, the real issue is that the majority of alleys have utilities in them, and so the abandonment process doesn't really work. But we will look at it with each of them to see if it does and give them that option. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. So we move on to item 10. This is a consideration of citizen petition related to urban camping. We have staff give a presentation. Chairwoman Stark and subcommittee members, because the city council was briefed yesterday at executive session, staff was not planning a presentation today. And there was more follow-up to be uh, heard, as you heard yesterday. There's more follow-up to be heard at, ex at a future executive session. OK, thank you. We have a, a couple speaker cards. Elizabeth, are you here? Yeah, I thought I saw her. She first brought the petition to us. If you can go up to the microphone, thank you. Thank you. After several citizen petitions, I'm very happy to be um, finally addressing this issue in a meeting. Um, basically, this petition concerns compliance with Martin v. Boise, of which the Supreme Court has rejected the appeal by Los Angeles, which means that the entire Western United States under the Ninth Circuit has to follow this ruling. Already Glendale and Tempe are following this ruling and allowing sleeping and camping. I think to find a real solution, I think you might look to what Joel said earlier, not necessarily specific tents or what have you, but creating spaces where people can actually go and live. This is the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is not criminalizing sleeping. That's just a way of pushing people aside, pushing people out, and harassing them for things that they can't control. About 50% of the homeless in the area are unsheltered, and that's not necessarily their fault. With CAST, you can only stay three to six months. What are you supposed to do for the rest of the year? You're not supposed to do anything. You're not supposed to sleep because the city of Phoenix tells you it's a crime. Now, I know that you suspended enforce, not enforcement, you haven't suspended enforcement. It was in the news yesterday uh, that you closed down a camp of, I believe, six people, um, which certainly merited all the officer time and community bridges, I'm sure. But um, I think that it's an issue that you need to deal with systematically and you can't deal with it through the criminal justice system. There are people getting felonies for this. I know people who got felonies for sleeping alone because they talked back to an officer. There are people that are getting felonies on public trespassing for sleeping. And that doesn't help anybody to get into shelter or to find a job or to get back on their feet because they generally don't have criminal defense. And if they go through homeless court, I think you have to plea. I don't know, maybe it gets wiped off your record. But it's a felony, so I don't think it could go through homeless court anyways. So um, I just want to make the point that I've made before. You guys need to be in compliance with this ruling. And I would also urge you to be in compliance with, compliance with Levon B. City of LA and not do homeless, not do sweeps of people's property every Wednesday around CAS and honor your uh, rules that you came up with before and make sure the police follow them regarding friends being able to rush friends other possessions because that's still not in existence yet as a policy under the police. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Haley Ritter. <clears throat> well, she, can I say something? Oh yeah, please. I just wanted to publicly thank you, Elizabeth. I think you've, you've stayed in front of this. You've been in public comment um, and your citizen petition took us to a place where our legal department's looking at it and we're hopefully changing policy. I just wanted to thank you. Thank you so much. 
Haley, hi. Good morning, council members. Um, I'm a good friend of Liz's, and we've known each other a long time, and we're both very supportive of general community and 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 well-being for for people all over the city. I, uh, as most of you know, I ride my bicycle everywhere, so I see a lot of people, a lot of a lot more and more and more homeless people on the streets, and it. I've witnessed police officers harassing people for sitting or sleeping on the sidewalk and and it it hurts a lot to see um, us as human beings treating each other so poorly. So to reiterate what Liz said, I think temporary camp encampments and just allowing people to be there, there's more and more elderly homeless people. That's becoming a huge problem too. And fortunately, I, I come from a good family where my father uh, took care of his retirement and he has a place to live but but there's other elderly homeless people who are just running out of money and 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 not knowing what to do with themselves anymore and that's just a big issue that I am very concerned about so I'd like to see I'd like to see the city work very hard to try and resolve this issue and come up with some some really good solid solutions for for places where people can actually rest and, and take care and, and, like Liz said, get back on their feet again. So thank you for, for considering this issue. I appreciate it. Thank you, Haley. And the next speaker, I hope I'm saying this correctly, is it Boo Boo Baez? Did I get it? Did I blow it? I bet I blew it. Oh, right. oh. <laughs> thank you. And generally, we're giving people two minutes to speak on this issue. We did give Elizabeth a little more time. Since she, she should just take her the microphone. No. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Uh, my name is Booba Bias, and I'm with Rambares, um Chapter Lieutenant, and um. I'm very directed with the, we feed the homeless, and I'm very strictly with the vets. And I have an issue with that. Our vets come first. And I don't like it when they're homeless. When they come off our planes or off our buses, they should come with housings. Number one, housing. Not homeless, not on drugs, not on issues with alcohol. Um, they should have housing. There's no excuses. Why are we having excuses? Um, Home Depot has those little shacks. They're just sitting there, just sitting there. They can be used for our vets, and they're just being used and wasteful. We have people in construction can build, can build little studios, little studios for our vets. There's no excuses. There's no excuses for our vets to be homeless. Oh, and, and for rehab issues, too. And why are our vets having issues for getting help? And we should have people going out there picking up our vets and taking them off the streets. There's no excuses. Me and my husband have been feeding the homeless out there for nine and a half years, and all I see is, no one taking care of our vets. I don't understand it. And you say that you love America? Bullshit. Excuse my language, but that's how I look at it. And then you have for you guys voted for um, Donald Trump. Oh, no, no, no. He don't even give a crap about the vets either. Because if he did, we wouldn't have a homeless issue with them. Our vets would have homes. They would not be homeless. Shame on that. Shame on our, that homeless direction. And they wouldn't be killing themselves either with suicidal issues. Thank you. That should not be acceptable. Thank you. That should not be acceptable. Thank you so much for your words, and especially your support of vets. My, my husband served in the Army. I appreciate it. 
so that's all the speakers we have on this item. And so with this petition, we are going to continue to work on understanding the court cases and improving our processes. So thank you, and thank you uh, for all the speakers. So we'll move on to item 11. Chairwoman Stark and subcommittee members, today to, for a brief presentation on item 11 is our city clerk, Denise Archibald, and deputy city clerk, Elizabeth Martin Parker. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. This petition is a petition that is requesting the council to split council meetings into administrative and constituent focused. Administrative being items that are more routine items and where uh, there might not be much uh, constituent concern and continue to have those meetings in the afternoon. And the second constituent focus would be items that are potentially contested, including zoning meetings and other meetings and items that are of wide interest. And those would uh, be proposed to occur in the evening. And so in order to change the council meeting uh, times, the rules of council proceeding uh, would need to be changed, which is in city code section 260. And that particular um, section of the code currently advises and directs the time and content of meetings. And so the council over the years has made changes to the rules of council proceeding, including attempting to change uh, meeting times in the past. For example, in 2012, um, the meeting for formal was actually changed to start at 5 p.m. Um, but then based on the response from the public, the, it was moved back to 3 p.m. in 2013. And so there are other avenues that the city council has encouraged to have uh, public participation and increase uh, public participation, including the fact that we published the council agenda a week in advance, it's online. We published the videos for the council meetings online as well shortly after they occur. We televise the meetings currently. And so there are several other avenues that persons have and are encouraged to participate. Um, however, uh, staff can definitely research uh, increasing public participation. For example, looking at electronic um, ways to participate remotely or also providing uh, comments electronically if the subcommittee so wishes and staff could research uh, methods existing currently or things that may be out there that we could use in the future to increase public participation and come back with something in March if you should, should wish. Thank you. So in essence, we've tried it before and it didn't work well, but you're committed to looking at ways to broaden participation like they do at the state legislature? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'd appreciate that. Um, any comments before I have the speakers come up, or do you want to hear the speakers first? <coughs> speakers, yeah, first? The speakers first? Okay. So, Christina. <coughs> there she is. <laughs> I had an opportunity to meet with her, so thank you. Hello. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank the city's clerk's office for looking into that, and I appreciate oh. the time that you put by, into this. By the way, I apologize. Someone yield their time to you, so we'll give you four minutes. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, so I do appreciate you taking the time uh, to she look was, into that. Um, I would like to just very briefly address um, what you're saying. I understand that, like, in 2005 you attempted this, then moved it back in 2013. But I think if we even look at just simply midterm election returns and if you look at kind of the increase in political participation, civic activism, there really has been a noticeable increase on all levels. That's nationwide, and we've certainly seen that here in Phoenix. So um, I understand what you're saying with that, but I'm not convinced that 2013 is going to be an accurate barometer for the type of response you would receive today. That that said, I do appreciate the fact that you're willing to increase people's ability to engage in real time if they're streaming the meeting. That is an issue. Um, if one of my council members says something that galvanizes me to action and I'm looking at home, I can't submit a comment card and then comment on it in real time, and that is an issue. Um, so I appreciate you making an honest effort and looking into that. Um, all of that being said, however, I, I am still going to stand by and ask that we find a creative solution or at least consider some of the following things. Uh, first of all, there are two main populations that get excluded through daytime meetings. Uh, the first would be basically the working popular, you know, people who work standard business hours. This downtown is full of skyscrapers, full of office workers, and people who are not C-suite do not have the opportunity to attend meetings. Um, and that's a problem. And then you also have a lot of shift workers too who are only gonna get 30 minutes, you know, during their lunch or whatever. Now you're not gonna make everyone happy. There's also graveyard hospital workers that couldn't make an evening meet. I understand that. But I also think, given the growth of population, the continuing growth of people in this city, and 
the large percentage of population that are office workers that do work standard business hours, that is a significant swath of people who are being effectively excluded from their right to participate. And again, I'm, I acknowledge your efforts. I appreciate it. I am not convinced that's enough. I don't think 2013, given the last three elections, is a proper barometer to measure what kind of response you'll receive. Um, and I don't think that means that you don't try again. That's just, that. with all due respect, that's not, that's not an adequate answer for me. And if you are gonna do that, then I would highly suggest that the city, you know, and I don't like the idea as a taxpayer of paying for this, but then show me the numbers. Go out and do a poll. Let's do a survey. Let's talk to people. Let's see the percentage of response you get. If you're going to refuse to change the times, then let's make that something quantifiable. And I, like I said, as, as a taxpayer, no, I don't like the idea of paying a consultant to go out and do that, but if that's what it takes, then at least if you're gonna say no, give me a reason. Like, tell me why you're saying no. Um, and so that's pretty much basically it. I, again, I really do appreciate uh, Councilmember Garcia, your office met with me. Thank you, Councilwoman Stark, for meeting with me as well. Um, I do appreciate the time you took. Thank you to the city clerk's office. I mean, everyone has been pretty responsive and I appreciate you taking this as seriously as you have. Um, it's a really serious issue. We are the sixth largest city in the country. You can't exclude a huge percentage of the citizens of the city from being able to engage. I mean, you have the library district, school district, civic participations, non-governmental civic organizations, kids' soccer teams all meet in the evening. There is a reason for that. So that's pretty much Thank you. same spiel. Thank you. Um, we have another speaker, Sean. I think Sean, I, there he is. Welcome, Sean. Um, first of all, uh, I'd just like to recognize Christina. I think she's done a really great job presenting this and being on it. So thank you, Christina, for submitting the petition. Um, as she mentioned, it's an extremely important issue. Um, I probably won't be as kind about it um, because I'm pretty distressed with sort of the way that this has been going over the last year or so. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, um, over the last year, um, there have been things done by the city council, specifically directed by the mayor's office, that have been to disengage the community. So um, from the very beginning, you know, moving the citizen comments at formal meetings from the beginning of the meeting to the end of the meetings, taking citizen petitions and moving them from the actual formal council meetings to the subcommittee meeting. Um, and last but not least, um, <laughs> updating the city code to allow the mayor or whoever the presiding officer of the meeting is to shut down comments and over the last month or so this has already been used to shut down the speech of over a dozen or two dozen or so uh, speakers um, at formal city council meetings so what I would like to remind people is that um, you know these these individuals have some important issue to address the council on they come at 2 30 uh, take the day off of work uh, pay for parking, which is only partially validated. And at the end of the meeting, they're told, oh, the meeting's over. You don't get a chance to speak. So Christina's uh, petition won't solve all of these problems, but it is a huge step in the right direction. And whether you want to follow her exact recommendations, which I think there are a lot of really good recommendations in there or not, the idea is to increase public engagement, not only attendance, but ability to interact with the council. So I really hope that you will uh, take this chance to get the ball rolling on this and start going in the opposite direction that we've been heading over the last year because it's really disheartening. Thank you. Thank you, um, <coughs> Councilman. Oh, yeah. Sean, we need you back. Just, uh, yeah, <laughs> I just uh, the last council me uh, meeting I witnessed you sit there for three hours and, and saw that you weren't. Uh, acknowledged and brought to the mic and I personally apologize but I just want to actually say in the public that I don't think it was right that that happened to you you sat through all the agenda items and your card was never called so uh, thank you for, for coming to testify and, and being yeah. engaged and it's happened to as I mentioned dozens of people already over just over the last month or so so it's not just me <laughs> thanks Carl Thank you. So I think you will be coming back with some uh, recommendations. I would encourage you to meet with Christina. I think she had some good ideas as well. You did? I, I, someone bowed their, oh. 
Oh, I'm. S I apologize. There are so many cards on the next side that I might have put it in the wrong public. Please come on up. I'm sorry. <coughs> Catherine. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'm Catherine Roxlow. Um, this, I want to thank um, the subcommittee for working on this and Christina also. I was thinking, I started coming to meetings for another issue and I thought the next thing I'm going to work on is when these meetings are and how many people they allow to speak. So um, I have something. Am I allowed to give? Um, um, some of my neighbors are retired and can only drive during the day. They can't drive to meetings at night. Daytime meetings are best for them. I'm already out of time. <laughs> Deb, you got to help me out here. My kids moved out of the house. I don't know anything about know. electronics. Boy, if they would me. just move back tell in. Me. I don't like being an empty nester. I know, I'm sorry. It's tough. It's all tough. Um, just leave it off and I'll be short. I promise. Um, Okay, some of my neighbors can't go to night meetings because they can't drive at, drive at night. Some of my neighbors work during the day and can't come to daytime meetings, um, and, and a nighttime meeting would be better for them. I've seen people who feel very strongly about an issue, work hard to protect, prepare a statement, sit and wait till the end of a meeting, and then not be allowed to speak because more than 10 people were asked to. Um, some cities, I have heard, in, in, nearby um, allow everyone who asks to speak for three minutes up to midnight of the day of the meeting to speak. I request that we expand the allowable time for speakers um, at the end of the council meetings and the number of people who can speak. If people make an effort to come to a meeting, that means they really feel important for that this, this is important, and they should be allowed to speak. They deserve to be able to speak. Thank you. So, yeah, please. So, I, so uh, first, there we go. Here we go again. Uh, so, first, <laughs> I just want to thank Christina and all the and all the speakers, every everyone that spoke on this on this item. I just oh, had okay. I had a question here. Uh, what would the cost be um, to change the meetings to the evening? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, uh, Vice Mayor Guardado, we would have to, that would be part of our analysis actually in terms of figuring out, because it will depend on if we're implementing a new system, for example, the cost of the system, the type of staff that might need to be required to be at the meeting. So if we're splitting meetings, for example, into contested or not contested, or the type of staff that have to be there and participate. So we would have to review that as part of our research, and we can definitely do that, and then bring something back um, a little more concrete in March. So I would also like for us, um, if you could bring back examples from the different nearby cities, like what is it that they, you know, what is it that they do, um, you know, what are some of the good practices that we could actually probably um, implement? Because it is true, the city has grown a lot since 2013. Um, and I think that we, I mean, again, very thankful for everyone that came and, and spoke on this, on this issue, because I think we definitely, you know, it, it is true, we are the fifth largest city in the country, um, and I do think that we need to give access to everyone. So, yeah, I, I would love to be able to see some com comprehensive plan mm -hmm. on how is it that we can ad address this issue without having it to be costly um, to, you know, to our constituents. Um, that, would, that, would, that would be the best things, and hopefully we can come up with that solution. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yes, Thank we you. will include that type of research. Any other comments? And so the, so I feel similar. I think the the other than city, I think the state is the closest thing that we should look at. Um, I think to me also of interest is the data that gets held behind. I know we keep the cards and all that, but I think if we were able to do electronically, even as people show up and sign up, we would be able to know what district people are coming from and, and where they live and all that sort of stuff. So I, I'm more interested in, in figuring out the data piece. And obviously, I think the cost is important. I think a rotational uh, thing where one meeting's in the day, one meeting's in the evening, has, in my understanding, has not been tried before. So I think this is a creative solution to trying to figure out uh, how we can kind of please everyone 
and and definitely knowing the cost of an evening meeting because I know our staff is having to be there knowing the cost and what it would take would would uh would be important um so yeah those are those are those are my comments think any other comments okay and Sorry, just oh, no. <laughs> one more Go thing ahead. I forgot. So I know we voted on something that the mayor had put forth that had to do with with the speaking. Um, I personally, and I spoke to the mayor's office as well about it. We didn't. A lot of us didn't know what we were voting when it came up, and so I, I would. I don't know if it's in this subcommittee or if it's somewhere else. That actually, that we can dive in a little bit more. I think we've had conversations with some of my colleagues who didn't realize what it was that we were actually doing. Um, so kind of understanding what's in the city code and, and what is it that we can change and what also, what is in the mayor's hands. Yes, thank you very much. So you'll come back in March we will. and look at some of these options to try to improve our transparency with the public. I would appreciate it. Um, as you know, I used to be a city staffer, and I did work for a city that did have their meetings in the evening. But there's pros and cons on both sides. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Appreciate Chair and it. And the council. Thanks. So our next items, 12 through um, 16, we're going to collapse the presentation and just do one presentation. But we will have to vote separately on uh, or take action separately on the four petitions. And I've been trying to organize the cards as staff comes up and gives her presentation because many have yielded their time to a speaker. So I'm trying to organize that. <laughs> um, I don't want to ignore anybody that filled out a card, but let's have the staff present, then we'll get organized here. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Madam Chair, subcommittee members, uh, my name is Katherine Sorensen. I'm the director of Phoenix Water Services. Uh, for the benefit of those in the audience who are interested in this uh, presentation, with me today is Assistant Director Troy Hayes, uh, Darlene Helm, who's one of our deputy directors in charge of water engineering, and uh, we have Patty Boland here with us as well from the law department. Um, we're very pleased to be here before you today. I know this is an important topic. Um, we're here to talk to you today about two different but interrelated uh, pipeline projects. These projects relate to our ongoing efforts to continue investment in aging infrastructure and to prepare for a future that is becoming hotter and drier. Uh, both pipeline projects are located in the same neighborhood near 20th Street in Lincoln, and both pipeline projects uh, run through the Phoenix Mountain Preserves. Uh, residents who live in the neighborhood that will be impacted by the construction have raised concerns. And uh, four different uh, petitions have been filed relating to the pipeline projects. Uh, we're here today to talk about the pipeline projects and the petitions. Um, both pipeline projects are integral to the health and welfare of our residents. The city has acted within its authority and staff does respectfully request denial of citizen petitions. However, uh, and this is a little bit of a teaser, but um, if you'll let us get through to the end of this presentation, uh, I think we have some good news and some, some solutions that will um, hopefully make many people very happy. So um, there, there are four separate petitions, as I mentioned. Some are asking for unique things, and some are asking for kind of basically the same thing. Uh, this is a summary of the requests listed in the petitions, and, and certainly not meant to be a verbatim representation. So like I said, there are two independent but related pipeline projects in the neighborhood. Uh, one relates to the rehabilitation and replacement of an existing 48-inch pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipeline. Uh, the other relates to a new 66-inch pipeline that's necessary for our water uh, supply resiliency, which really has to do with our ability to provide reliable water deliveries during extreme events. Um, but first, just so you have some context of the importance of these pipeline projects, let me give you a really brief overview of the Phoenix water system. So uh, Phoenix Water Services provides safe, clean drinking water to about 1.7 million customers over about 540 square miles. This is an extremely large service territory, uh, one of the largest in the country. 
and it entails 7,000 miles of water mains that are necessary to move water where it needs to go. Um, and these mains can really vary in size from very small, about two inches, to nine feet in diameter. Um, we also have five surface water treatment plants, uh, nearly 200 pump stations, reservoirs, steel tanks, wells, other facilities, not to mention um, tens of thousands of valves and about 50,000 fire hydrants. So our focus in today's presentation is on our large pipelines, uh, which vary in size from about 16 inches to about 108 inches in diameter. Um, a pressurized water distribution system, so the way I think of it is that it functions basically the same way a human circulatory system works. So large pipes function basically as arteries in our system. Uh, smaller pipes function as blood vessels that bring water to kind of the extremities of our system. Um, the wastewater treatment plants you can think of as kidneys. Um, they're cleaning the water. And our pump stations kind of function as hearts, and they, they move water where it needs to go. We have about 600 miles of, of large pipes in our system, uh, and these are made up of various types of materials. Uh, in particular, we have about 160 miles of a type of pipe called pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipe. Um, these pipes, particularly those installed in the 1970s, um, are very problematic. Um, these pipes were held together, I have a, a prop here. <laughs> these pipes were held together, together with metal bands, which unfortunately over time are now known to corrode and break. And when enough of these bands fail, it's really important to understand this pipe doesn't just leak. It, it literally explodes. So here's, here's my, my prop for you. It's a newspaper rolled up in, uh, with rubber bands. So if you can imagine the metal bars are like these rubber bands. And if enough of these break, this comes apart. And that, that's, the, um, that's what we face with these pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipelines. Uh, in 1999, the city of Tucson experienced its first catastrophic failure of this type of pipe. Uh, for them on a 96-inch pipeline, you can see the aftermath of that. And you can, you can see the size of the hole in the pipe. And you can see the bands that have broken. Um, Tucson lost, I don't know, untold millions of gallons of water. Um, and about and had to pay out about five million dollars in damages to surrounding properties. Um, unfortunately, Phoenix has had a similar experience in uh, 2006. A 60-inch pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipeline failed. Um, it was near 36th Street and uh, north of the I-10 freeway. Uh, it, this is a picture of that failure, and here again, you, the orange, the kind of orange bands you can see are the the metal wires that have failed, um, similar to the rubber bands I described on, on my prop here. Um, this photo shows the aftermath of that. And uh, we end up paying uh, about more than $7. Uh, $7. That'd be great. $7 million. <laughs> yeah, about $7 million for this pipe failure. I know, this was, this was about 7 bucks. Yeah, exactly. So um, obviously, we don't want to experience additional catastrophic failures of our large pipelines. So we now do have um, a very proactive program through which we go in and inspect these pipelines and monitor their condition. Um, the green arrow in this picture kind of shows you where they're inspecting the metal bands on this particular pipeline. And then based on those assessments, we, we prioritize which pipes are most critical in our system and most at risk of failure. To this date, uh, the city has inspected about 64% of the pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipeline inventory in our system. And we have uh, rehabilitated or replaced about 16 miles of that. So in uh, 2018, we assessed the condition of the existing uh, pre-stressed concrete cylinder pipeline that's in the neighborhood in question. Um, and at the bottom of this chart, just you know, to orient you, you can see the 24th Street water treatment plant. You can see Granada Park. Uh, the, the blob that you see in, in brown there um, is the outline of the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. So this main was constructed in the 1970s uh, to provide for growth in the northern portion of our service territory. It was really constructed before the neighborhood uh, grew up around it. Um, and we constructed it to be forward thinking about future conditions. And, and this pipeline has served us very well. 
Um, we need to continue to be forward thinking about our infrastructure. Uh, what we found in the 2018 assessment um, are several cracks, which are evidence of instability and indicative of near or imminent failure of this pipeline. Um, we've, uh, as I said, we've inspected about 64% of the pipelines of, of this nature in our system, and we've rehabilitated many miles. Of those we have inspected and not yet replaced, uh, this pipeline is the most distressed in our system. And our engineers recommend that we uh, replace and rehabilitate it as soon as possible. Uh, so zooming into the area uh, on the previous map that was highlighted in red, um, the most critical portion of this pipeline um, that needs to be replaced is in the neighborhood just north of the 24th Street water treatment plant. So we will be constructing a new pipeline, um, which allows the old pipeline to remain in service while we're constructing the new pipeline. I think you can imagine it, it is a very complex process for us to take down our, our main lines, our large pipes. Those, like I said, are our arteries. So it's not a simple thing. Uh, we have five water treatment plants in our system. As I mentioned, hundreds of pump stations. We have to time the outage of all of these facilities um, with the need to repair and replace other major portions of our system, yet still maintain reliable water deliveries to our customers. And this means that oftentimes we have very small windows in which we can re uh, complete rehabilitation work. So uh, constructing the new pipeline allows us to extend that window so that um, we can be sure that we're taking care of all the different uh, projects that we need to in our system while still maintaining reliable water deliveries. Um, so, um, on May of, in May of 2018, Council approved the design contracts for the engineer and construction manager at risk of this particular pipeline. And in September of last year, uh, Council approved construction of that new pipeline and the rehabilitation of it. Um, we anticipate construction for this pipeline beginning as soon as March. Um, probably towards the end of March, we think, and lasting through the fall of, of 2020. So the second pipeline at issue in this neighborhood is a 66-inch pipeline, a new pipeline that's really necessary for water supply resiliency. Um, let me give you just a really very brief overview of our water supply portfolio for context. So about 98% of the water that we deliver to our customers comes from surface water. Um, about 58% of that comes from off of the Salt and Verde River system. About 40% comes off the Colorado River system. And then a very small portion of the water we deliver to customers uh, comes from groundwater. Um, our dependency on surface water forces us to be constantly vigilant about climatic and, and hydrologic conditions and to be forward thinking about preparation for a hotter and drier future. And as I've said to you uh, before, unfortunately, the Colorado River is over allocated. It is over allocated by about uh, 1.2 million acre feet. For context, that's about four times what we deliver to our customers every single year. So it's a large over allocation and it's a large problem. And then, of course, uh, just to make matters worse, uh, scientists do tell us that because of climate change um, and, and facing a hotter and drier future, the flows of the Colorado River may diminish by as much as 25% in the future. So there are two major reservoirs on the Colorado River, Lakes Powell and Mead. Uh, Lake Powell is about 50% full. Uh, Lake Mead water levels are hovering around historic lows. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you have seen this picture in the newspaper, um, but it, it shows you kind of how dramatically water levels have fallen in the last 20 years on Lake Mead. Uh, we are in a drought on the Colorado River system. Basically, I have no good news on the Colorado River system. Um, and even though this watershed did receive uh, good snow last year, and that's fantastic, we need many more winters like that uh, for this system to recover. Um, and this is, this is concerning to us because water levels in Lake Mead dictate the amount of water that Phoenix can take off the Colorado River system. Um, just last week, the Bureau of Reclamation, which runs and operates the Colorado River system, uh, sent me their latest water level projections based on current conditions. 
the chart was included in attachment F of the uh, committee of the subcommittee report. And these projections do show that if we experience the same poor hydrology today that we experienced in the early 2000s, that Lake Mead water levels could fall below elevation uh, 1025 by the year 2024. Um, below, it, this is really important, below Lake Mead elevation 1025, there is no agreement and there is complete uncertainty as to the amount of water that Phoenix would receive. Um, one of the petitioners noted that the uh, Arizona Water Banking Authority has stored millions of acre feet of Colorado River water underground uh, for the purposes of mitigating against shortage. Um, I, I serve as the secretary of the Arizona Water Banking Authority. I can tell you that is absolutely true. But unfortunately, um, there is no um, a physical, legal, or financial agreement or plan in place for us to be able to recover those water supplies. Um, we've been pushing for the development of valid recovery plans for many years, but they are not in place. And so our, the availability of that water is still very uncertain. Um, worst case scenarios may not happen, and, and let's all hope that's the case. Um, it could snow like crazy for the next several years, um, but hoping for snow is just, it's not a valid water management strategy. Um, and I would put forward that if the Bureau of Reclamation sends us a chart that shows how bad things can get, then we had better have a plan for addressing those conditions. So we need to be prepared for restrictions. Um, why is Lake Mead important to the city of Phoenix? Well, as I mentioned, uh, water levels in Lake Mead determine how much water the city of Phoenix is able to take off of the Colorado River system um, and use in our municipal water supply system. So uh, our water system, it's, it's very uh, bifurcated. So for the most part, those who live south of the Arizona Canal, which um, on your map is this area kind of shown in, in orange or brown, um, they receive Salt and Verde River water um, through the SRP Canal system. Those who live north of the Arizona Canal, uh, shown here in blue, and that's around 400,000 people. They receive Colorado River water delivered through the Central Arizona Project. Uh, our ability to move water between these blue and orange areas is, is very limited. Uh, we do have supplies on the Salt and Verde River system um, that, are, that we are legally allowed to use outside the boundaries of SRP. Um, and we have some surface water that we've uh, previously stored underground that we could use in case of restrictions on the Colorado River. And we do have native groundwater supplies. So we've talked about this before. The city of Phoenix does have enough water. We have enough water supplies. Uh, what we lack is the infrastructure to move it where it needs to go uh, during times of extreme shortage on the Colorado River. With our existing distribution system, we just simply cannot push enough supplies from that Salt and Verde River side of our system up into North Phoenix to meet demands. And we can't meet demands um, in North Phoenix on groundwater alone. Uh, this is because our water distribution system is, uh, was designed and built uh, be to be dependent on a small number of large sources of supply delivered through our five surface water treatment plants. Um, not to be dependent on a large number of small sources of supply through wells. And so our pipeline system is simply is not constructed that way. It doesn't work hydraulically for us. So in addition to rehabilitating and replacing the 48-inch pipeline um, in the neighborhood, we need to build the new 66-inch pipeline um, to get water from our 24th Street water treatment plant up to 32nd Street and Bell Road to connect um, our infrastructure to be able to supply the northern portion of our, of our system. And here I'm going to turn things over to Darlene, who's head of our engineering section. She will explain um, the pipeline analysis and the process that we went through. So the city conducted an extensive alignment analysis to determine the best path for the new 66-inch pipeline to get from 24th Street, uh, our 24th Street water treatment plant, uh, to 32nd Street and Bell Road, where we have uh, existing pipelines that this new pipeline can connect into. 
but as you can see from this map, there are uh, several constraints in the area, like the Arizona Canal. Um, there's also the SR-51, and then uh, the preserve, which is kind of shown in that light pink, brownish color, um, along with our existing 48-inch pipeline. So in addition to the constraints that I've mentioned, we also have to take into account alignment space limitations for construction and future maintenance. So I'm going to review the main alignments we analyze, and I'll start with our Cave Creek uh, Road alignment. So we did look at uh, possibly taking the pipeline, uh, again, north through the neighborhood uh, out of the 24th Street Water Treatment Plant and along, uh, kind of jogging over to the Cave Creek alignment uh, and then getting back to our infrastructure um, up in 32nd Street and Bell area. Um, this alignment was uh, about two miles longer in length, um, which then raises water quality concerns for us. Um, so the longer that water uh, is in a pipeline, uh, it starts to age, and we have to be uh, concerned with that. Uh, in addition, because of the pipeline uh, going to the west, we aren't able to interconnect uh, between the existing 48-inch, um, which then uh, reduces our reliability and redundancy with the two systems. This pipeline also costs $50 million more than uh, the, what we refer to as the 22nd Street alignment. The total number of impacted properties adjacent to the alignment on the Cave Creek alignment was over 1,100, which is over 550 more than the 22nd Street alignment. In addition, uh, we would need to basically acquire two properties, so possible condemnation along Cave Creek. Um, and then the traffic impacts and disruptions, we're talking tens of thousand vehicles per day um, that would be impact along uh, Cave Creek Road. We also then looked at uh, what we refer to as the canal alignment, and there were some variations to this alignment, uh, but this is a longer uh, pipe length. Um, also along the canal uh, coming uh, just west of Granada Park, um, before this uh, State Route 51, there's space limitations in that area. So um, we can't physically place the pipe uh, next to the Arizona Canal and or next to the Arizona Canal diversion channel um, or in between because there's an existing um, bike and walking path and there's just not enough physical space. Uh, there's also in the variations, if you were to cut back over along the SR-51 on the east side, there's many private property acquisitions that would be required. Um, and then in addition, if we could uh, go along the canal, it would require SRP, Flood Control District, and Army Corps of Engineers uh, approval. So we did reach out to SRP and talked with their chief engineer, um, asking if they would permit a pipeline um, next to the canal. Um, and they told us they would not permit the pipeline adjacent to the Arizona Canal due to pay, uh, space constraints and canal integrity. So then we uh, looked at the 16th Street alignment. So still heading north through the neighborhood, but then um, going across the 51 over to 16th Street. So again, this is a longer length of pipe, about a mile longer. Um, it's $18 million more than the 22nd Street alignment. Um, the total number of impacted properties adjacent to this alignment is over 800, which is a little over 220 more than the 22nd Street alignment. There's also major utility uh, conflicts. Um, we would cut across at Myrtle. Um, it would cause a full closure of Myrtle between the SR-51 and 16th Street just to be able to locate all or relocate all the utilities. Um, the traffic impacts um, in, for this alignment, 16th Street uh, has, uh, you know, in the tens of thousands, but then it's also Northern that's really impacted uh, with the volume of traffic that travels on Northern. Uh, in addition, there are two uh, uh, additional SR-51 crossings for this alignment. We did also look um, in the preserve area, a slight variation in the alignment uh, to go closer to the Dreamy Draw Dam instead of following the bike path. Um, and so um, the issue with this is that when uh, we were having our initial discussions with Flood Control District. They stated that in today's standards, they do not allow construction uh, under 
or in close proximity to the dam due to the concern of integrity of the dam structure. So that's what pushed us to the bike path in the preserve. And then um, the ADOT alignment which was our uh, one of the other alignments we looked at. So, uh, and we've already kind of alluded a little bit to this alignment, but uh, early in the investigation, uh, this alignment was not considered because uh, we needed to either get a permanent right of way from ADOT or an irrevocable permit so we wouldn't have to move the pipeline. So uh, uh, that's why this alignment was not originally considered. So then that takes us back to what we refer to as the 22nd Street alignment. So we know there's been some criticism about the analysis process we go through to determine uh, which alignment uh, for the new pipeline. Uh, this is a delicate balance uh, the city must maintain. It's our job to remain objective and not create a situation where neighbors are being uh, pitted one against another in the decision-making process. So and it's also a delicate balance of when we come forward to the community to present information about the alignments. We, we need to have enough information to be able to answer people's questions, but then we don't want to be too far along in design that we can't make an adjustment in the alignment. At this point, I'm going to pass the over to Patty, who's going to talk about legal authority. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Um, we were asked, um, the law department was asked whether or not um, this pipeline could legally go through the mountain preserve. As you know, the charter protects the preserve for preservation and very specific purposes, such as wildlife and native plant protection. However, the charter does allow certain uses um, with, without um, the um, protections being applied for those uses. And one of the uses that is preserved to the city council is the ability to um, locate city-owned flood control or water treatment facilities in the preserve. Um, the charter, unlike some other uses in the preserve, the charter does not require a specific action by the council to approve this use. It's a use that is, is presumed acceptable in the preserve. Um, um, I'll point out that the, um, the language in the charter is water treatment facilities. So the question was, can we do a pipeline? Um, and our conclusion was, if you could do a water treatment plant, you could clearly do any facilities related to water treatment, um, including a pipeline that attaches to a water treatment plant, as this one will. So uh, again, um, the law department feels comfortable that this is a permissible use within the preserve, and that as the council goes forward and and um, awards um, the contracts for this work, that that is sufficient um, uh, permission from the council for the work. Okay. Um, in one of the petitions, sorry. Yep, sorry about that. In one of the petitions, it was brought up uh, whether or not the proposed alignment meets the standards uh, set forth in our city design standard manual for water and wastewater systems. And the proposed alignment does meet the standards. So the manual states that a route study uh, shall be performed. Uh, the city conducted an alignment study in accordance with this requirement through our engineer, PEC. Uh, the, uh, that was also noted the minimum easement width of 80 feet uh, noted in the citizens' petitions uh, for a pipe size of this size. So that does not apply because this pipeline is being constructed in right-of-way, not an easement. Um, so just, uh, just to kind of explain, so we ask for 80 feet when we're getting an easement because we can't control what's constructed up to the easement. Uh, but when there is right-of-way, uh, there are requirements for building setbacks, which ensure that we get uh, additional uh, space So when we construct in the right-of-way. 
Um, so the pro proposed alignment is governed by Section 3BI of the uh, Public Water and Sewer and Right-of-Way. Um, that's the section that applies for the alignment. Um, so it uh, specifies that we need to follow just standard utility uh, locations in the right-of-way, but then it also gives us um, if there is some variation in that standard that a variance could be applied for. So now we just wanted to take a minute and um, highlight some of the outreach activities the city has undertaken for this project. So the city has mailed out 932 invitations uh, to the public meeting on October 24th. We placed 932 door hangers for this public meeting. Um, we shared information about the project with approximately 350 attendees of the public meeting. Uh, we made um, five visits to the faith, faith uh, institutions uh, in the project area. And we attended uh, six meetings with the school, um, the elementary schools in the area. So Madison Heights, Mercury Mine, which is at the very northern end of this segment of the uh, project, and then also with the Paradise Valley School <coughs> District. So some of our ongoing public outreach, we will be uh, presenting to the Parks and Recreation Board uh, with a project update on the 23rd. Uh, we're doing a presentation to the North Phoenix Chamber of Commerce, um, specifically talking about our segment along 32nd Street. Um, we will be mailing and uh, door hanging uh, our uh, mailers for our open house meeting, which will happen on February 4th. So the mailers and door hangers should go out the week of January 20th. We're going to be canvassing the neighborhood, neighborhood to um, talk with residents about the upcoming construction work that uh, Catherine mentioned on that replacement pipe for the 48 inch. We're going to be doing an update uh, on March 16th to the Phoenix Norton Preserve Mountain Parks Preserve Committee. Um, there'll be street signage. Um, that will be put out with how to contact um, the project team during uh, construction along with construction notices. And then we'll have an email uh, distribution list that we'll maintain to uh, send out the most up-to-date information on the projects along with our uh, website that we have where we'll be putting our, the most up-to-date information. So as Catherine mentioned uh, in the beginning of the presentation and then also State Representative Lieberman um, made a comment earlier at the, at the meeting, we have a new path forward. Um, so this is our, you know, we hopefully think good news for, um, for this project. So we've been working with ADOT over the last couple of months and we do have a draft intergovernmental agreement with them uh, where the city, ADOT's going to abandon right-of-way and then allow the city to purchase. So what that looks like, um, the shift in the alignment in the area. So this was the previous 66-inch alignment. And then the new alignment uh, will uh, still head north into the neighborhood along 21st Street alignment. But then at Myrtle, it will head to the west and then follow the 20th Street alignment until um, we're up into the preserve. So um, what this allows by shifting from 22nd Street, or we're avoiding that construction on 22nd Street. But in addition, we're avoiding the trail access at 22nd Street. Um, it also avoids um, a tunnel under the uh, mountain just west of that trail access and uh, some of the more pristine area of the preserve. So then the new ADOT alignment um, that we're showing here, it'll still go through the preserve, but we're uh, more along the State Route 51 and then moving along the old Dreamy Draw Road and the bike path. So just some updates of our construction timeline. So as we mentioned, the 48-inch replacement pipe would be March 2020 is our estimated start of construction through the fall of 2020. The new 66-inch pipe in the neighborhood would start fall of 2020 through summer of 2021. And then in the preserve, starting at that southern portion in January of 2021 through spring of 2022. 
So we don't want to make light of the temporary inconveniences that people will experience around the construction area, but we want to assure everyone that we'll work with the community uh, to maintain access. So um, we're going to have access for bicycle, pedestrian, and vehicles during construction. We've also been working with Madison Heights Elementary for their school drop-off pickup area. We're um, coordinating our construction time schedule around the uh, summer break to ensure that, that the drop-off and pickup uh, can go smoothly through the school year. In addition, then also working with their bus uh, drop-off and pickup. We'll also be working with uh, Public Works to ensure that you continue to get trash recycle pickup, um, any of your mail deliveries. Uh, we've also worked with our emergency responders, fire, to ensure that they can get access into the neighborhood uh, during construction. And then also working with parks to ensure that there's access to the park and the parking um, in the Granada Park. So this is just uh, all of the ways that uh, you can get in contact or uh, get information about the project. So we're maintaining the project website, which will have the most up-to-date information. We have a project hotline. Uh, we have an email address that people can contact us. And then as I mentioned, we're going to have an email distribution list that will send out um, updates of what's going on with construction um, as, as it gets near. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Catherine. Okay. <clears throat> so just um, in summary, both pipeline projects are integral to the health and welfare of Phoenix residents. Uh, the city has acted within its authority, and we uh, respectfully request that the Land Use and Livability Subcommittee deny the citizen petitions related to these pipeline projects. Um, and recommend that the Water Services Department continue community outreach and engagement throughout the project. With that, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? So I just have one one question. Um, with this with this new route, what's the savings cost with that? So, um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Councilwoman Guardado, we, we, we don't know yet. Uh, we hope there is some. Um, the new alignment allows us to avoid an expensive tunnel, but we're also, because of the new alignment, going to need to build a, a rather substantial wall to protect the homes that are up against that right-of-way. So we don't know yet um, exactly what the cost difference will be, um, but we're hoping it's roughly the same or potentially a savings. Any question? Yeah. What is the, the new pipe that we use? What's the life expectancy? So folks would know that this isn't coming anytime soon, or, or it might be, I don't know. Yeah, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. So um, the pipe that we mentioned, that the pipe that was built in the 1970s, uh, specifically were built with different standards than they are today. Um, for this size of pipe, um, we wouldn't be using this type of pipe uh, that we uh, were referencing. So they're they're built to uh, you know current standards today. We know more information just about the pipe integrity. So um, the life expectancy we say an average of 75 years is what we should be seeing. But again, some can be less because that's an average. So you could see some in that 50 year range to 100. So okay. Any other questions? Okay, we have a lot of cards. We have enough cards to have two hours of testimony, and I'm not sure. Okay, I know Catherine's excited. <laughs> did you have some of your eggnog today? <laughs> um, and I did have a chance to walk this, and um, I'm relieved to see that we're getting it off 22nd Street, because that really is a main thoroughfare for that neighborhood. Um, and I thank the residents for walking with city staff. So I do want to condense the time, though. Um, so what I've seen here is a number of you have uh, given your time to a speaker. So I'm going to try to look at the speakers, look at the, the items. We're going to hear them all together. But if you want to speak to a particular petition item, that's fine. And so I'm going to start off with Patrick Mullen, because that was the first petition. And there's Patrick. Hello. You were given up to 12 minutes. 
can you try to <coughs> thank you i'm gonna set it and hope you help us out thank you Patrick. <laughs> no that's I, absolutely i'll keep okay it as, thank you as sure as i possibly can thank you absolutely go okay uh my name is um <laughs> dr patrick mullen i'm a citizen of phoenix and president of the phoenix mountain preservation council I'm also a Vietnam veteran, and I use the preserves as a place for peace and sanctuary. That's why I live here in Phoenix since the mid-80s. <laughs> I'm a desert rat. So anyway, um, the PMPC is a longtime steward and advocate of Phoenix Mountains Preservation Preserves. PMPC cares deeply about the preserves. We have worked for more than 40 years with citizens and officials, including Governor Bruce Babbitt, Mayors Terry Goddard, John Diggs, and Margaret Hans, and many others on the preserve matters. We appreciate and recognize the efforts of the mayor, um, Representative Lieberman, ADOT, and especially the city council and this subcommittee. We just really appreciate your listening and making this available. Um, and what we really asking the short of it is to grant our petition so that in all of this, yes, the city has authority, but we would like community, commu direct community uh, interaction, not just giving information. So on behalf of myself and PMPC, we are here to affirm the concerns and requests dated in our uh, December 4th citizens petition which is before you today. We ask that you do not deny our petition. Instead, that you temporarily pause the, this pipeline project and initiate a citizen engagement group to work with the Water Services Department on a pipeline alignment in a transparent way. We have reviewed a copy of the meeting packet on, and the January memo by the Water Services Director, Kathleen Sorison which states that the water department is now considering a new alignment, which we presented up uh, 51, the right of way. While we are pleased to see this new alignment may bypass certain pristine areas of the preserve, it's still like it's still looks like it's going through part of the preserve. In addition, we are very concerned about the numerous neighborhoods, the local community that will be impacted by the pipeline. You know, we should really look at this. And that's why we're all here today, PMPC and the neighborhoods in orange. However, Ms. Sorison's memo, which was issued without any contact with PMPC or anyone else, raises a lot of new questions. Her attached map, map actually cuts off before showing where this new proposed alignment in the preserve will be. This sort of frustrating patterning is inconsistent. Incomplete information has been a concern since the beginning. You know, first we were told affirmatively that the alignment through the preserve was set. Now we're being told that the alignment alternatives are still under consideration. Then we were told that conditions on the Colorado River make this an urgent emergency, but everything seems to make clear that the Water Department emergency claims are a little bit overstated. Then we were told that the Army Corps would not issue a permit. This was not true. Actually, we learned that the Water Department is able to apply for and obtain a corps per, uh, permit. It would just take time. Next, we were told that ADOT rights away could be crossed and could not be run adjacent to 51 right away. This is also not true. We are now being told that the Water Department is considering an ADOT right away alignment. But conflicting information remains an issue in this. Next. Although we have repeatedly reminded the City Council and the Water Department of the requirements of Chapter 26 of the City Charter, which requires voter approval for projects impacting the preserve, we have yet to have a clear explanation why the Charter is not being used. The Charter explains clearly that impacts to the preserve must be approved by the voters. Finally, we are still being told that there were no federal funds associated with this project. This is also untrue. We are aware that the Water Department is in the process of attaining a $172 million uh, grant in Federal uh, Water Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act funding for this project, and that will require a NEPA review. We are unclear on why this particular major project detail is not mentioned in the Council's report unless the City is aware of it. 
From the beginning, almost done here, from the beginning and to date, we have received no consistent, reliable information regarding this project. Considering PMPC's decades-long working relationship with the city on preserved matters, the levels of incomplete and misleading information on this project is unprecedented. Citizens of Phoenix who love and use the preserve have the right to be informed about projects that will impact it. The city and its departments do not have the right to act secretly in regard to the preserves, no matter the reason. And the last, in order to ensure transparency and citizen oversight on this project, we urge you, the subcommittee, to pause this project and recommend a full city council, to the full city council, that a citizens engagement group be established to work directly with the Water Services Department ADOT and other agencies so that we can participate in the decision-making process about the reserve and on behalf of our members, the local community and the neighborhoods and the many people who just love the preserve. But this is not done. This is not done. We are really acting for that, asking for that engagement committee and we really want to see a way where the local community, there is an engagement group that can have input when we have this discussion, not just go through the process and get memos on what we're doing now. So thank you very much, and my great respect for the subcommittee and the city council, and thank you. Thank you, Patrick, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you for shortening <laughs> your time. We will make sure everyone that yield time to you gets into the record, correct, Penny? Thank you, okay. So our next speaker specifically on 12 is Libby Goff. And we have four minutes for you. Hopefully, same thing, you might shorten it. Thank you. I'll make it as short as I can. Thank you. I'm, I'm Libby Goff or Elizabeth Goff. Um, I am a um, resident of Phoenix. I'm a lifelong resident. And I hike in the preserve um, a couple of times a week. One of my go-to spots is that 22nd Street trailhead that would be affected by the original route. Um, I'm also secretary of the Phoenix Mountain Preserve Council, the PMPC. Um, and, and the first time I realized that, that this was going to go through that 22nd Street trailhead was when I saw the stakes that were marked as, as I did the trail um, not too long ago. We are so glad to see the alternative route that people have worked together to come up with. Um, it would be a definite improvement as far as the preserve and the surrounding neighborhoods. But we have many questions about that uh, for the preserve and the neighborhoods. Um, for example, the agreement with ADOT is a draft agreement. What happens if that doesn't go through? Uh, to date, we, we haven't found out about things. We haven't been able to find out about things um, prior to them happening. And although this route looks really great, what happens if the ADOT agreement falls through? Where do we stand then? And how will we find out about it? Um, we, we feel like we have not been given complete information. Even when we ask very specific questions, we're given incomplete information. The process is not transparent. So what makes us think that this route will actually happen and that we should have any trust at this point in, in what's being told to us? Um, like Patrick said, we have many decades of experience in the PMPC working with the city council. And, and we have always been able to make it work. We've worked together. So we don't understand why we're kept in the dark and given incomplete and incorrect information in this instance. And we would like to have the opportunity to work with this, the city on this to make sure that a good route is, and the best route available is, is decided on, and um, we understand that a water pipe is necessary for the city. We've never said we don't want that to happen. We've just said we don't think that the best 
route has been taken and and that we have been communicated to uh, completely and and we would like to see that big change happen in the future that's why our official letter asks for a committee um, a citizens committee to work on on this with you thank you very much for your time and your commitment to making this work thank you um Catherine maybe you can speak to when the IGA will come before council because it will have to be come before us correct uh, yeah um, madam madam chair subcommittee members yes I'm sorry the date of that is uncertain I, I know we were hoping that we could get it before the city council um, on the agenda for the 29th of this month but that that might be a little optimistic um, and it also doesn't need to go through the ADOP process but everything you know is on track and it looks as though um, this will come to fruition okay because when it does come to council we'll make sure you guys know about it and that you're there I promise okay so we're gonna move to these were no, actually Catherine you filled out for all the agenda items but I know you submitted um, number 13 so Catherine Roxel so Catherine um, they you have been granted 20 minutes again 20 minutes that's yeah. all that's all I had thought I, I had 20 I minutes per item no I'm sorry I'll do the best I can I know but, you'll be succinct um, you know what I really feel um, is an issue here is um, is what does the city value um, do you value community input or are we just going to go with what the engineering department says and what Aaron Lieberman says I know that Aaron Lieberman represents us but he is not us and we're here to talk to you because we have um, strong feelings about things I have I thought every item was going to be separate so I have documents for, for you folks thank you on on number 12, um, Patrick and Libby covered this very well, so I will be brief. Um, according to what I look at, Arizona Revised Statute 287047 says, a political subdivision of the state shall not construct, lay out, open, or establish a street, road, or highway through a designated mountain preserve unless the construction of the street is approved by a majority of the electors. And um, as Patrick said, we still don't know exactly where this is going and in my handout I will show you I can show you the route um, we don't know exactly when you have a diagram of this size you can't tell exactly where things are and then the next page shows construction and construction areas in the road and is that a new road or is that an old road is that a road that's already be, been um, what do you call it fixed up um, Re no, um, re put back to normal to restore. Is that a restored road that we're going to make into a road again, or is that a paved road right now? So, any my understanding is any construction road should be on the ADOT right of way, and hopefully, that this construction project will not cause any more roads, and that includes construction roads in my mind. Um, moving on another set of documents and I'm sorry um, you know we're doing the best we can yeah, as citizens trying to bring things up and um, you know maybe we weren't as smart as Aaron Lieberman you know and I'm sorry I, I wasn't going to bring up any names but it, it upsets me that Aaron Lieberman gets to go first because he's busy like we aren't I know there are people here who have doctor's appointments and they may have to leave before they speak or people you know there everyone has value does the city value all of the citizens or or do you think that you know better than us um, so on petition 13 the things I want to talk about um, well first of all I really want to thank all of you I want to thank the subcommittee all of the city from the mayor down I know everyone is working very hard on this and we really appreciate it we appreciate the change that is coming through that change if that is implemented will help all the people on 22nd Street that only had one ingress and egress to their house which is a very dangerous way to have construction 
for all those people. 335 houses had only one ingress and egress. If we make that change, that will be so good for those people. But still, our neighborhood north of Lincoln is going to be very much impacted, and the neighborhood south of Lincoln is going to be very much impacted from this. Um, we want to ask you to continue to work to ADOT with ADOT and finalize that. We're asking that you delay the construction on both pipelines, not forever, just for a little while until all the routes can be evaluated that are possible. We still think that there might be another route for the 66 inch pipeline. And if you look at this handout here, oh, I don't have it here, but um, the 66 inch pipeline is planned to go east of the 48 inch pipeline. If you build the 40 inch pipe, 8 inch pipeline, I'm worried that that will stop a possible route that's further to the west for the 66 inch. So I'm just asking that you evaluate all the, all the op options for both pipelines before that one gets constructed, just in case there's a better route. Um, people, um, People up here said that, that they've evaluated this fully. I'm sorry, but I don't feel like all options have been fully evaluated. And Patrick went into some of this. We were told that it couldn't go along the Highway 51, and now part of it can. Maybe, maybe this is innovative. Maybe we need the city and SRP and the flood control district to think outside the box and do something a little different. But do we value communities and the health and safety of our residents? Or is the bottom line the pennies, the dollars, the exact dollars? Is that most important is the cost? Is, 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 is my water bill, I'm willing to pay a few more dollars for the city to do something right. And I think all of the city is. I think I would feel that way if this was construction in South Phoenix. I feel this way about make an analogy of traffic. I would rather, I know it would be more expensive for everyone to have electric cars, but I think we should go that way for the health and safety of the people that live near the roads, the highways, that have bad air pollution and are going to the hospital because their lungs aren't in good shape. I, I think, I, I, I beg you to not just have the dollar amount be the only issue. And I also firmly believe that these pipes, the, the intention of engineering is not to have large pipes on residential streets that are 50 or 60 foot right of way. And I know that the city has said, I, when I did my analysis at first, I talked about easements and in the second um, uh, handout that I gave you, I show you the design standards manual here. I've made copies of two pages, um, one page says um, within this, the city has made a commitment to early citizen notification and involvement. The goal of identifying neighborhood concerns has a high priority. Communication through print printed notices, a public information phone number, and public presentations could be a necessary element in construction plan approval. We're coming to you late because we didn't hear about this early. We're asking you to make some changes because we didn't hear about it until this was finalized. And we feel that we have some ideas that might be good ideas and are worth consideration. So, so will we be valued? The next page shows the minimum easement widths for water mains, okay? And it shows that any water main greater than 30 inches diameter needs a minimum easement of 80 feet. Now that, my understanding, and I might get this wrong, I apologize, but my understanding is that 80 feet easement is before an area is constructed, that it's built out. Do you think that if a neighborhood, before it's built out, needs 80 feet to put in a pipeline, that they should need that much space once the houses and the neighborhoods are there and the kids are there and everything? Yes, that, that's why that is there. Maybe it doesn't belong there. Then. If you'll move on, so I heard them and, and I read what they said. They say go to the transportation um, page and I looked that up for, to go to that and that's what my next part is, this City of Phoenix utility locator maps. And you'll see that on the, the detail for an 80 foot right of way, they show a water main greater than 16 inches diameter is, is on there where that would go. 
They're showing that on an 80-foot right-of-way, it makes sense. But then when you go to the 50-foot and the 60-foot, it only shows local water, 12-inch or smaller pipelines. Now, the city can make adjustments. The city um, engineering department can waive all requirements. But is that our values? Are we going to waive our requirements for our community health and safety? and say that these should go in because it's a few pennies cheaper on our water bill, should we say that these should go in neighborhood streets? That's to me what the issue is. What is our value? Is it, quite frankly, I'm tired of the city being the cheapest. Let's do something great. Let's do something really well. We're a big city. We, we can do things valuably. We can, we can be an asset and, and not just the cheapest. Um, <coughs> One more. How am I doing? I'm still within my yeah. original oh, yeah. 20 minutes. OK. Surprise, surprise. Am I making sense? Keep speaking. OK, keep speaking. OK. Um, on, on petition 14, um, we've requested, again, some of the similar things, but but also um, a new alignment study. And again, if we had been, if the citizens had been involved at the beginning and we had understood what was going on, we would have asked for this earlier. And again, I'm not thinking that this would be a whole lot of time. We're talking a few months. I'm asking for them to redo an alignment study on this petition. And um, within that, keep the two alignments that were previously studied but change the grading scale on it. Um, add one or more alignments um, to the evaluation that includes some of the right-of-ways, Maryland, 16th Street, Northern. I heard that this would be a big traffic congestion for Northern. I went to the city, I went up to the eighth floor and looked at the water sewer maps. I've looked at all of the right-of-way documents. And there is plenty of room up there. There is more than a 100-foot right-of-way up there. I do not think it would restrict traffic drastically up there. 16th Street and Northern look very, very good. And I've evaluated all the records. I'm not a professional, but it, it sincerely looks that way to me. So consider some of those. Sincerely talk to SRP and ADOT about a new innovative way to do this. Maybe, you know, they said no once, but can we really talk to them? I, I don't consider that ADOT owns that right-of-way. I think the citizens of Phoenix own it. We own it, and it's for all of us. And we need to, city, the city of Phoenix is too mature now to just say everybody has their own right-of-way and, and we don't share. It's time for all of us to work together to come up with the best plan and the best route for things for everyone. And maybe we need to share our right-of-ways. Um, so I have that. Then I'd like to see the scoring um, be different, that four-lane streets with wider right-of-ways are scored higher than two-lane streets. Now, the way it worked is a four-lane street may have more traffic on it than a two-lane street, but it's not as profoundly impacted. A four-lane street can go down to two lanes, and those streets that are moving vehicles very far, people have a choice. Lincoln has been a two-way street for a year, and I know it. And it's a little slower. I went on it yesterday. It was a little slower. I actually calmed down, chilled a little bit. It was good for me. Um, but if I'm in a hurry, I can go down to McDonald and, and go that way if, I, if I'm re really feeling rushed and I don't want to go through it. That's the beauty of doing work on four-lane streets. Maybe there's a lot of traffic there, but if you have construction on 16th, People can go to 12th Street and go through, or they can go to the highway and go through without being on 16th Street. There are ways to mitigate it. When you're in a neighborhood that doesn't go through, these two neighborhoods do not go all the way through. And, and when you limit ingress and egress, it's a real mess. And the other thing is, when you're on these small streets, you're going to be doing construction 10 feet, 15 feet away from a house that has people in it, kids, families in it. So I think that, that those streets should be given a lower grade than the larger streets. And I think if you did this and you worked with the grading scale that way, that it would help. I have other things that I'd like you to consider. Um, 
Alignment two is 16% shorter, but was assigned 10 times more points than alignment one. The weighting should be more in proportion with the length of the variance. Um, alignment two was 12% less expensive. Um, and I really question whether all the costs were in that alignment. Did you have all the costs necessary for breaking bedrock because you'll be in more bedrock there for air control and noise control in a neighborhood? Um, but anyway, it's 12% less expensive, but it was assigned two times the number of points. And I'd just rather see the points given in this assessment um, more pro be more proportional. Um, score paths that run adjacent to elementary schools and preschools lower. You know, if we can avoid going near these schools, that would be better. Um, score paths that do not impact the preserve as higher. Do we value the preserves here? Are, are we valuing that or is a few dollars less that I important? Um, gosh, I'm doing great, Deb. Okay, um, I have more things that I'd love to talk about if I had more time. If you can give me another hour, we could do a bathroom break and I can come back. Okay, okay. Um, we're asking you to evaluate safer, smarter options and routes for the project, okay? Sincerely, we're asking you to sincerely do an analysis of Highway 51, Maryland, Ocotillo, 16th Street Northern, city streets with no houses, city streets that are wider, flood diversion areas as options. Um, consider putting both pipelines in one road. If both can go in one road, it might be cheaper, take less time, and cause less disruption. Install a liner in the 48 inch pipeline. Instead of digging it up, which they say they can't dig it up everywhere, anywhere, um, extend the life of it by putting a liner in. Maybe it'll be at a smaller diameter, but we'll have actually more water, and that will be much less destruction to those neighbors down there near Granada Park that are on these tiny, thin, windy streets. Um, and in closing, why is Phoenix always going the cheapest fix? The cheapest is not always the cheapest in the long run. You know, I want to value, value. I, I want the city to value its citizens, community health and safety, and, and do things right, right. Even if the cost is slightly higher, we feel that the community safety should be put at a premium and be weighted in the alternative analysis. And I'll yield my extra four times to the next speaker. Thank you, Catherine. The next speaker, Sam McKenna, and you will yield a couple extra minutes, so four minutes. Hi, Sam. How do I follow that? Hi, my <laughs> name is Sam McKenna, and I am a resident of Granada Park. And again, I, I extend the thank you to Vice Mayor Guardado, Council Member Garcia, Council Member Stark, Council Member Williams, staff, who is probably spending as much time as we have on this, and everybody who came here today, they took off work or they carpooled to get here. Um, I'm going to reiterate um, what all my predecessors have said. The fact that we are here today shows that some steps were missed. Um, and I'm going to delve into um, community engagement. Um, to give you a little snapshot, Granada Park is a small little neighborhood, working class. We're not on top of the hill. We don't have the amazing views. We have four routes into, I, but I mean, I'm grateful, right? We have four routes into our neighborhood. You're going to affect three of them um, for for who knows how long. Um, I feel like we're better than this. It almost seems to me, if I were thinking, how do we get to this place, that a need was identified, we need water up north, and that we identified we had the funds, but now we need the vendors to make that happen. I don't think that the public and stakeholders were really um, involved, because I think the public is our most important stakeholder. Um, there's a lack of coordination. I would say most of us can compare because we have late night phone calls and we email each other. We even get together on Sunday nights. We keep getting different answers. So just moving forward, it would be great if all the departments were on the same page. So we had some really great, strong answers. It's okay to say you don't know, but please don't tell us different things that we're gonna compare and spend hours researching. Um, 
where am I? Um, so make no mistake, we understand the importance of water conveyance and aging infrastructure that needs repair. Um, we just don't understand why the narrow collector streets would be chosen in residential areas other than the arterial five lane thoroughfares that can accommodate one lane being shut down, that can accommodate in that absorbed area. Um, I carpool to work every day, took today off, heading tw down 24th Street, and I can tell you that it goes to one lane. But that's okay, because I know it's needed, the project that's, that's going on. But to think of my little neighborhood, to think of other neighborhoods, to think of people that come in and out and use the park, to think of the police officers who come in 65 plus a day, in and out to the police substation, all having one route out of my neighborhood, um, scares me. And I, I worry about the flag guy um, who will have to direct us. Um, again, we're working class neighborhood. We're not on top of the hill. And the thing that scares me is, is now, because of this situation we're in, I really lack confidence in the current plan. Um, as I said, three or four routes are going to be tremendously impacted. And I am so grateful council members came and walked with us or sent staff. And, and that says a lot. What really surprised me was on our second walk, which wasn't the one that we advertised and invited everybody to, but just something sort of impromptu on the fly, as they'd say. We were shown that, you know, well, you have a way in and out of Granada Park. There's the, there's a street light. Well, apparently nobody did their homework because that street light is on church property. So if we want to access that street light and access our neighborhood, we have to go through a tr church parking lot, which is routinely closed for church events, like, like their Halloween party and all sorts of great things. So that to me, just that little minute detail says to me, let's step back and let's pause and let's see if maybe there, we can just take it through a little slowly and see what else we might have missed. It's like a second set of eyes. We almost feel like, ah, oh, we caught what could have been a really bad situation. So. Um, and you mentioned 932 um, folks were reached out to. So that says to me that there are going to be 932 people who you've identified who will be tremendously impacted versus, what, the 1,100 on the other route. Um, so, so just putting things into perspective. Um, so alone, we have 550 homes. I think it's a really good start. Being here is a tremendous start. But um, I think that we're better than this. Um, and I think I need to speak on the other item too. Okay, next up. Um, they're changing design standards. Holy, am I, I am had I, you for four minutes, sorry. Okay, maybe but anybody <laughs> defer to me later? Maybe Jeannie can come up, Jeannie Sw Swindle. And as you're coming up, you have people have yielded you up to 14 minutes. So, but hopefully you'll hopefully I'll, I'll cede some of that back to her. Yeah. yeah. Thank My, you. I'm, Thank you, Jeannie. Excuse me. I'm Jeannie Swindle. I live on North 22nd Street, about three houses down from the trailhead into <laughs> the preserve that um, we've discussed. You know, so many of the points that um, you know that that I have to make, uh, you have heard numerous times. Um, I do a lot of training, communicating, yeah. education. Redundancy is important because it reminds you. Um, but I do want to say thank you to all of you for paying attention to us, listening to us. We do feel it was a little late in the game. Um, but an incredible effort by the community and um, to you know, put orange signs up and call attention to it and to collectively put together their, um, their thoughts um, and concerns so that we could voice them to you. And certainly thank you to you and to um, the Water Services Department, the, the whole city council, the, um, and, and, you know, Aaron Lieberman for making our voices louder and amplifying, and the mayor. Um, but what we would like, well, first of all, let's, we have hope that an ADOT agreement um, will be finalized and that there is a segment of this um, pipeline project that will be um, saved saving the neighborhood as well as saving the preserve. However, what we would ask is that there are still portions, if you look at the entire project, that um, are of concern to us. And um, Sam mentioned them before. If you go back to the beginning, the beginning, I won't take you back there, but where this is starting, two pipes, 48 and 66 inch, um, the 24th Street in uh, Maryland water treatment plant. Go back to the beginning and see, is there a way to bring those over 
to SR51. Expand potentially the agreement that you have with ADOT to take it up as, as much as possible on land and um, that has already been um, affected, if you will. And um, I know that there's all plans. You did a great job of, um, the staff did a great job going back through and countering every single thing in all of our petitions, and I appreciate that. However, if you just step back for a minute, if you take a plan that was finalized and, and basically given to us and what we felt at the time being forced upon us, and you were able to, in two and a half months' time, come up with an alternative, a little prompting, a lot of work on your part, but to change a segment of it, hmm, maybe you could do the same thing with the parts that are still impacting the neighborhoods in Granada Park coming under and over Lincoln and the beginnings of the uh, Medicine Heights and the Biltmore Highlands area up to Myrtle. Something to think about. We are asking that you analyze that. And when you do that, go back to those designs that you already had that you showed maps of. When you do that, include the experts in those other areas, the BLM, the um, SRP, and certainly please include the community because we live there. We can tell you what an impact would be. That's what we're asking. And it, quite honestly, that's just, um, if nothing else, it's courteous. <laughs> um, some of my other points um, that I wanted, do want to bring up, um, let's see. So with that, in that process, the, um, the two pipes, 48 and 66, you know, first it was presented to us as one project. No, they're all together. And if you look at the maps, it's phase one for both of those projects, for the, both of those pipes. And then phase two is when it hit into the preserve. Um, and now they're separated and they're called independent yet related. They're very related. One has to be done before the other one. Well, in the process of looking at realignments potentially and options, uh, the reason that we're asking to stop right now before you proceed is that an alternative plan for a portion of the 48 could impact the ability of the 66 if that were to be um, overlapped. An example would be if you took them from the plant directly across Maryland to the 51 or from Ocotillo over to the 51. If you do the 48 first, will the 66 be able to pass over under it? Those kinds of things, that's the thinking. You're the engineers, you're the experts in the Water Services Department, um, not us. But we have the ideas, and we've done a lot of work looking at maps and um, doing a lot of talking. We do appreciate the, um, the opportunity to be involved in that you're listening. But um, for future projects, you know, part of what our plan is to grow feeding smarter. And we would really like to be involved and to have communities involved in whatever project you're working on. It's certainly one of this magnitude earlier in the process because it avoids all the work that we made you do, <laughs> all the anxiety that we had to communicate it to you. The end result so far is, is, is looking good, but you know, thinking smarter and building smarter. Uh, the ingress, um, the access, um, if, and it's not even so much if the um, um, agreement with ADOT um, doesn't go through. The, um, oops, you know what, hold on a minute. Thank you. And what I wanted to point out, Catherine went into this um, um, in, in, in more detail. But in the presentation that was made in October to the, um, at the, um, the Madison Heights School, the information session, the, um, the one map that, or the one slide that was being shown was the, um, the residential construction impact. And it's very, very important to us, health, safety, and the environment um, in terms of our residents um, as we go for, go forward, and they're on two lane residential streets, which just from a common sense standpoint with this size of a pipe does not make sense. But we were told that there would be two lane traffic maintained, and, and we know that there at times will be a, um, a flagman there. But the, the information that was shown to us was not realistic, is that it was shown no crane, and I've given this to you, no supply truck, there's fill material that will be pulled out of the trench. Um, 
how is that removed? There's going to be a waste removal truck, construction crew, support vehicles, as well as traffic control vehicles. Where are they going to park? So the impact into onto the streets, and this is especially important when you look, I'll talk for a moment about North 22nd Street, right in front of the school, especially important there because during drop-off and pickup times, it's already so congested that it's very, very difficult for people to get in and out of the neighborhood. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the children that go to Madison Heights are from out of the neighborhood and out of district. And what does that tell you? That means that a lot of the kids in the neighborhood go to outside schools from how do they get in and out? Right now, it's North 22nd Street is the primary um, entrance. If you follow 22nd Street up, and we talked about this from the segment if if the pipe was going all the way up 22nd Street, the um, egress and ingress that would be affected. Um, it's still going to affect all those people because the bottleneck will become at North 22nd Street. And let's talk the health and safety for a moment and the noise and the dust and all of that. But you not only have adults that are impacted because many people walk their kids to school or walk the neighborhood. We're a very active group. But you also have kids. And you have kids so close to where that construction is going to be that it is not safe. And even though you reached out, quite honestly, early on from your outreach um, list that you wrote down in, um, I think it was in May, to the uh, Madison School District um, or, or Madison Heights some facilities manager, all the other imp conversations and outreach that you, you documented happened after July. July, starting in July and going forward. We heard about this first in October. So again, it's saying that we appreciate the efforts that you made in terms of outreach. However, you got to do it earlier. And in um, respect to what Patrick was saying, and we agree with more consistently. Although it was pretty clever to send out the email to everybody about the good news last night um, for the potential um, to the list that um, people who had attend the, uh, who had attended the, um, the meetings. So the streets are too narrow. Catherine went into that. I just um, showed you some signs on that or some pictures. I also showed you um, attached to that is a, um, a map of the ingress and egress. The same thing holds true for south of Lincoln from um, for the Granada Park area. Um, they're landlocked and will be landlocked with um, the construction going on. Just from Lincoln, there are only two exits south into Granada Park. Um, the third one would be through the church parking lot <laughs> that, that Sam was talking about earlier. Um, the, same, the same kind of access will be um, hindered to the Madison Heights and the Biltmore Highlands because 20th Street and 21st Street will be um, consumed, if you will, by traffic. That puts it all back onto 24th Street. And thank God there's a light there, that, um, a traffic light that will be able to control some of that. <coughs> I have a list of all of the schools, the preschools, and the churches, and um, uh, Catherine, as well as um, Sam, and um, mentioned earlier that there are active communities that come from afar to attend the schools as well as the churches, and um, they are just as important, even though they don't live in our neighborhoods, as we are. So the concern we have is to stop. You know, look at some alternatives that are smarter and make more sense and um, include us in that process. And um, think smarter, because we're better than this. And we'd like you to help us be better, too. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the next speaker and people yield time to Gail Dixon. So it will be a total of 10 minutes. Gail. Wow, three strawberry blondes in a row. It must be an omen. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to address the subcommittee, Vice Mayor. My name is Gail Perry Dixon, and I live at 7049 North 23rd Street in Phoenix. I am a small business owner, and I am here today at the expense of my small business. Like many of my neighbors, I am opposed to the pipeline, 
but I am somewhat relieved by the new draft proposal. As a former water resource manager for the Salt River Project, I understand and appreciate the need for urban water planning. That was my job for 13 years. However, it is other logistics that I strongly oppose, and I may be repeating myself somewhat, and I do understand a new pipeline path has been proposed, but I would like to have my comments on the record just in case something changes. There is only one exit east of 22nd Street that exits on to Lincoln Drive. When construction closes portions of and restricts traffic on 22nd Street, the only way out for hundreds of families is exiting Squaw Peak Drive onto Lincoln Drive. All of that traffic diverted into residential neighborhoods will create a huge problem, not only for the drivers, but also for all of the property owners. To compound this problem is that within the next month, Porchlight Homes has announced the construction of, I believe, seven homes in the vacant desert lot on North 23rd Street, directly across the street from our home. North 23rd Street is one of the few narrow residential streets dovetailing onto Squaw Peak Drive and is the only ac access for construction crews building these homes. Traffic congestion from this project is already expected to be problematic. Diverting hundreds of more cars onto East Glen Drive and 23rd Street will create tremendous log jams for maybe years. Furthermore, if there is any kind of an emergency, we can be trapped in and emergency crews can be shut out. And even further, Squaw Peak Drive is the sole entrance to Squaw Peak Park, which compounds the dangers of this project now involving hundreds of hikers. We haven't even addressed the pipeline construction and the dangers of the trucking materials in and out of our narrow residential streets. Again, to the west of 22nd Street, and this has already been addressed, there are only two exits between 22nd Street and State Route 51. The congestion, especially during rush hour and school hours, will be unmanageable. We have estimated as many as 330, somebody said 335 homes within the affected area. Between people trying to get out to work and people trying to get to Madison Heights School, it's a nightmare that could go on for years and endangers our children. To force thoroughfare traffic onto alternative small residential streets, we must importantly think of the safety of the children of Madison Heights, who will be caught in the crosshairs of both the 48 and 60 inch pipelines. The other opposition I have is to digging up the Phoenix Mountain Preserve. I also believe the preserve matters and is a preserve for a reason. There are alternatives and together we can find them, but please do not impose this upon us without realizing the devastating negative impacts on our neighborhood for years. Please work with us. And I also want to thank some of the people that have been here today who have worked very hard on bringing our neighborhoods together. Thank you, Jeannie, Catherine, Sharon, others, Patrick, um, for bringing our wonderful neighborhood together. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, next speaker is Lisa Marie Smith. Two minutes. She just went to feed the meter. She went to feed the meter. So we're going to have. Oh, she's back. I, I signed up for a few we collapsed the. Uh, so just two minutes yeah. total. Did anybody have anything they wanted to say? Um, can I yield my time? Yes. May I yield my time? Thirty seconds, and then I'll give you the rest. Um, something I just did that I wasn't able to touch upon. Thank you again for letting me speak. Um, they're changing design standards. If you're going to spend three hundred million dollars over a three-year project impacting citizens, please demonstrate attention to detail. There's an innovative approach where. Um, pipelines are excavated at access portals and crews um, go to 40-foot sections and that uh, pre-stressed pre -stress construct, pre -stressed concrete cylinder pipelines, the crews go every 40 feet um, sections and they actually insert a liner inside the existing pipes. This was done in San Diego. They were able to reline 82 miles of pipeline, which actually reduces it reduced, uh, it was 40 to 60 percent less costly than traditional excavation and result, uh, resulted in much less community impact. So if you needed to replace something, you can rely on like San Diego. Um, they did 310 miles of the pipeline, pipelines 20 inches to 9 feet in diameter, which actually enabled them to accelerate their project and complete it in, in less time than they had originally planned. Um, they work with 24 member agencies, and I can tell you that IGAs, intergovernmental agreements, are made all the time with ADOC. 
out whether it's a lease or an outright purchase. So, um, and then there also there's technology that allows them to identify. There's a, a field eddy current scanning that allows them to damage to identify potential stressors and leaks in those pipes. So now you'll have those pipes less expensive, quicker time, longer life. Thank you. Thank you. You have 36 seconds. I just wanted to mention that um, somebody who's been involved with the preserve since there was even a preserve in place is Maxine Lakin. She's been doing this for over 50 years. She, she, made, she made it here to the meeting today, and, um, and she's not as young as the rest of us, so it takes a lot more effort, I'm sure. Thank you. you okay, thank you. So the next speaker, Tom Stowell, two minutes. Tom, not here, okay. Sandra Kane. Two minutes. Welcome, Sandra. Hello, my name is Sandra Kane, and I live in the neighborhood north of Lincoln um, and between 22nd Street and 20th Street, where the two pipelines were planned initially. I very much appreciate the proposal that will um, ease the uh, impact on the 22nd Street portion of this route, which would most affect me and my neighbors. And I also appreciate um, Councilman, uh, Councilwoman Deborah Starr coming to our neighborhood with the city representatives to walk the pipeline with us in the rain. We do appreciate that. Um, getting my points is, I, I think if this to, um, new alignment north of um, Lincoln goes through with ADOT, that will alleviate a lot of my concerns. But what, what concerns me is that um, it, it's still contingent and we don't know if it's going to be happening. And to um, start the construction until we know that that's gonna go through seems a little bit like putting the cart before the horse. So uh, we would, I would suggest or request, as part of my petition, I said, please halt construction at least until we know that that ADOT alignment is going through. And um, my other concern is to make sure that we have the, um, uh, input, neighborhood input with regard to the actual input impact on our neighborhood from the construction, the trucks and all that that's going through, the dust, the drilling, um, the vibrations that might affect the homes and the pools and the roads, uh, all those things we're concerned about and um, I appreciate your listening and your help. Thank you. Jolie. Derby or Dar? Derby. I'm sorry. I just couldn't read the. I didn't know if that was an A, E, or O. <laughs> Two minutes. I'm Jolie Darby. I live, uh, I'm with Sam. I am south of Lincoln. I'm actually on 21st Street. So my, my house, my neighborhood will be directly affected. I am a small business owner. I, anyone who lives south of Lincoln knows I own a kettle corn trailer. Uh, we do dozens of fundraisers we are our busy time is august through december <clears throat> it will directly impact us we don't have any place else to take our business this is where we prepare for our events this is where we uh, do our fundraisers for pch for all the schools for madison heights for rose lane for madison number one and it will directly impact uh, my business uh, there are a lot of kids on our street um, we do. Sam and I talked about a lady that lives on the corner that has dementia. We worry about her safety as well. Uh, she's right on the corner of Ocotillo and 21st. But we just ask that please come to 21st Street. Come and see our street. It's a very narrow street. If you have a car parked on one side and on the other side, a third car coming down has got to go very slow because chances are, I mean, there's just, there's not, there's just not the space on the street. And my trailer, it takes, a, it takes the entire width of the street to get in and out of my driveway. So it directly impacts uh, my business. Thank you. Last speaker is Kristen Winkleth. Wink, did I pronounce that? 
back to Jeannie, two more minutes. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, are you um, yielding your time then? Okay, thank you. I'll do this quickly thank so you. No, no, give her a chance to do a little no, follow-up No, I'm going to set it. Um, first of all, I've lived in the community. I was born and raised here in Phoenix, Arizona, lived in the community for um, 40 years. Um, so I have grew up. We've seen the impact of the 51, which with development and growth, um, everybody welcome to that. I want to focus first just on the people who live off 20th Street where this new 66-inch pipeline <laughs> Um, the home value for those poor people who live along there, um, where they want to run it in their backyards, basically, they already line up to the 51. And I really think a you need to really look into that because I know a couple who moved years ago uh, before the 51 has, have a nice home. Now their backyard is the 51, and that was their retirement home. So the value of their home, now they're going to have a pipeline, and they're talking about building this um, wall, I guess, huge wall. Um, so that will be their view. Um, also, I think we need to go back to where this began. Um, in October, I walked around and I spoke to almost probably everyone here. Um, I started a petition, um, which I have a letter. Uh, Catherine, the letter I have attached is the one that you wrote, so I hope that's yes. good. Okay. Um, it's, I had it prepared for the last council meeting and I did not get to speak, um, but I, uh, it's, so it's not the complete petition, but we have well over 300 signatures opposing this pipeline. So I hope you really take a look at that because I've spoken to 500 plus families in the neighborhood. My daughter and I have walked it. And up until the date of the meeting, people were saying, what are you talking about? Um, the flyers that they put on the mailbox, which I think it's a federal offense, I don't think you can even clip things on mailboxes, were all over in the streets. Um, they were not securely placed and the notification was just horrendous. And I feel like this was really um, a disservice to the community and to our great state and everybody here. Um, so I think we need to look at that. Um, and there needs to be some oversight besides people being their own oversight, the water department specifically. Um, I've heard some of the letters and responses from the water department, um, not to come down on people, but some of the language is inappropriate. So I will be submitting that. And I think you need to take a look at the, they violated their own um, water services department Des design standards manual by not giving early notification to the great citizens of our town. Okay, thank you. That's um, the cards to speak. We also have four cards we'll put into the record um, that did not wish to speak but oppose the uh, water line. So any questions of council? So we have to take these each separately, correct? You can either, uh, Madam Chair, you can either take them separately or uh, make a motion that cites all four. We just want to make sure there's a sep uh, at least an action on each of the four petitions. Okay. And um, regardless of what the recommendation is or our motion, I do hope you continue to work with all these residents and take into consideration some of them have businesses and we want to make sure they have their livelihoods. So do I have a motion or motion separately? We're all looking at each other. Well, we have met the regulation and we have heard this and um, I guess we just accept them. Is that what we're doing? And noting that staff will continue to work as this project goes forward. Um, Madam Chair, um, Councilwoman uh, Williams, I think um, I don't know that accepting them would be it, depending on what your your position is. To accept them would be ag to agree to um, the requests, which oh. include um, <clears throat> delay and, and the other things that are cited in the petitions. So well, um, I do not believe in delaying this project. I do believe in continuing to work with them and keep in communication. I'm confident that the ADOT will come through. They were at the meeting yesterday, and, and the head of ADOT confirmed that it was going to happen. But this is extremely important to all the citizens. If not this neighborhood, I have a feeling the next neighborhood you choose, we will have the same comments. So it, 
has to have some type of compromise that takes into consideration. Uh, I know it's very difficult. I remember what it was like when we were citing 51. Um, it's very difficult for the community, for this part of the community. But the people north, if, if that CAP counsels sooner than we anticipate, it would decimate the whole north third of the city of Phoenix. And I don't think we can postpone it for long. So I recommend. So I'm sorry, if I may, if I may Madam Chair, uh, subcommittee members, if I, if I may clarify, the staff request is denial of the four positions. Um, and I guess I would defer to our council about how that motion needs to be. I mean, I will say it. We're denying them. OK. But I also want to say I expect you to continue to work with them. Um, some of their ideas sound pretty good. I'm not an engineer, and I don't know the neighborhood that intimately. Uh, but I hope you would take them into consideration as you go forward. So 12, 13, 14, and 15 denied. Yes. Okay. Do I have a second? I denied them. You don't want to do that. I'll second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the eyes have it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Next on our agenda is call to the public. We have no more cards and then future agenda items. Are there any you want to see in the future? Okay. Thank you. We are adjourned.